Uh, good morning. I'll ask the, now ask that the live stream be started. Good morning and welcome to this meeting of the Audits, Audit and Governance Committee of Heritage Council being held on Tuesday, the 10th of May, 2022. For those present in the meeting room at the fire alarm sounds, please leave the building by the nearest exit and make your way to the fire assembly point in the car park. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on Herefordshire Council YouTube channel and is making a recording. To ensure that recording quality is maintained, please speak as clearly as possible and keep background noise to a minimum. Please ensure that mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. Others are permitted to film, to photograph and record public meetings, providing that it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If there are many members of the public present who do not wish to be filmed or photographed, please raise your hand now so that each person filming or photographing may be made aware. Only committee members present in the meeting room may vote. We have a number of people in attendance as virtual participants. And I request that they use the raise hand function within the system if they wish to contribute and to introduce themselves when they are called upon. Turning to our agenda, <coughs> um, first item, I have apologies for absence. Uh, I understand apologies for absence have been received from Councillor Dave Bolter and Councillor Yolande Watson. In addition, Councillor Jenny Bartlett cannot be present in person, but is in attendance as a non-voting member participant via the virtual meeting platform. Hello, Councillor Bartlett, can you hear and see us? Um, I'm, I can hear you and see you, Chair, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Name item two, name substitutes. Councillor Graham Andrews is substituting for Councillor Dave Bolter and Councillor Dave David Summers is substituting for Councillor Yolande Watson. And I welcome <coughs> both gentlemen to the meeting. Uh, item three, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare any Schedule 1, Schedule 2, or other interests in any agenda item? No. Um, I have a declaration. Agenda item 10 involves a report in which I am named. It is the advice of the monitoring officer that I recuse myself from that item, and also from agenda items five and six, as they solely contain questions relating to agenda item 10. Consequently, the vice chair, Councillor Olson, will take over the chair at that time, and I suggest that we take agenda item 10 following, uh, immediately following agenda item six, so as to reduce the disruption. I will then uh, return and chair the rest of the meeting. And I'm advised that the re recusing is necessary to, uh, to avoid a perceived conflict of interest in chairing the committee for that item. Item, agenda item four, minutes. Uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 12th of April, 2022 are included in the agenda for approval. No matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer. Are you content that I sign the limits as an accurate record? Aye. Thank you. The committee's action log is attached to the minutes and an updated version has been circulated in supplement two. The update being in relation to the revised date for action 102 and the progress update for action 103. Would any members want to comment on the action log? <coughs> We did go through the action log in some detail at the last meeting, but uh, it's an opportunity if uh, any members want to comment on any of the actions. I note a number of them have been um, await, still await updates, and dates have been uh, slipped forwards. But that does tend to, to, to happen occasionally. I'm pleased to see that we're back down to uh, just two sides of the A3 sheet um, and the number of um, completed actions. Comments? Move on. Thank you. Uh, 
five minutes later. Um, and at this point, I'll pass over to Councillor Bolton. We move on to agenda item five, questions from members of the public. Four questions have been accepted by the monitoring officer of this meeting and responses have been published in the supplement two to the agenda papers. Those members of the public who have sub submitted questions have the opportunity to submit a written supplementary or to join the meeting to ask their question. Uh, so I'll now ask the clerk to confirm if a supplementary question is to be asked for each of the questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the, um, we have no uh, members of public in attendance in order to ask questions, uh, and we haven't received any written supplementary questions from the uh, four questioners of, of Kate C. Kings, uh, Emma Morford, um, <coughs> and Carol Cogero. Um, of course, the, uh, the questions and responses to the two original questions are already given. Thank you. So we move on to item six, which is the questions from councillors. Can I just raise a question of, of process there? Sometimes the public, quite often the public in fairness, raise some extraordinarily good questions. And I'm often sitting here or in council thinking, I would like to ask a supplementary on the back of the question that the public has asked. Presumably there's something in the constitution that prevents us from doing so, but it does seem to me that sometimes one would like to take the issues a little further at that time, rather than it being lost in memory. I think there's two points uh, there, uh, Councillor Jimman. So firstly, I think there, there is a provision in the constitution, I, I think it's under the cabinet scrutiny rules, that unless the chairperson decides otherwise, no discussion will take place on any question or supplementary question. However, one of the reasons of moving agenda item 10 to immediately after the questions is so that we can have a thorough discussion and you can raise the questions you wish to raise at that point. So I forgot to press the button when I asked the question. So the generality is that if something arises in a question which is not subject to that day's uh, meeting, there would be no reason why a councillor could not ask for permission to uh, pursue that in a question following from the answer that's given. So for audit and governance, uh, we can only accept questions that relate to the agenda item, uh, agenda items. So it would be something that you could raise at that point of discussion. But the questions from the public are on the agenda, so presumably therefore you could raise it because the question is on the agenda in the first place. Uh, can I refer to? I think I think, I think that's me, I, that's at the discretion of the chair. Isn't it? Yes, and I think, and that's one of the reasons why we've moved the agenda forward, so we can make sure that we catch all the questions under agenda items. No, I'm pertinent. I was trying to avoid the particular of today, but asking this as a matter of process. Of course, we're a governance committee, and I just wanted to clarify the situation with regard to any council at any time asking a supplementary on the back of a public or indeed another member's question for that matter. And I'd yeah. just like to ensure that that could... Chair, I think the uh, officer is ready to, for, uh, to advise. Yes, Kate, um, Charlton, please. Yeah, um, what um, what I will do for all members is I will send out elements of the constitution that advise about um, members not being able to raise further questions on matters um, and um, uh, and so to clarify the point um, and I'll think Councillor um, Jinman further about your question about how we could might be able to take that forward and what the constitution enables us to do. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jinman. So moving on to agenda six, questions from councillors. No questions have been accepted by the monitoring officer for this meeting. So we will move um, 
to agenda item 10. Uh, progress report on the internal audit activity if urban and members <coughs> are in agreement. So the purpose of this part of the agenda is to update members on the progress of internal audit work and to bring to their attention any key internal control issues arising from work recently completed. To enable the committee to monitor the performance of the internal audit team against the group plan. To assure, assure the committee that action is being taken on risk related issues identified by internal audit. And I would ask that the presenting officer, Jackie Green, Assistant Director of SWAP, uh, introduce the report, please. Thank you, Councillor Balderson, and good morning, members. So, this is the internal audit plan progress report for 2021 22 um, before the annual opinion, which will be provided at your next meeting. Our updates include the progress report for the 2021-22 internal audit plan at 21st of April 2022, the counter fraud update, and the Herefordshire City Centre Transport Package Summary Investigation Report. The progress report provides an update to members on the audits that have been completed and informs you of any changes to the plan. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague Amy, who will bring you through the report. Thanks, Jackie. Good morning, members. Um, so since our last update to the committee, we've completed 27 audits, bringing the total audits completed for this financial year to 52. There are currently three audits at draft report, and we've got eight audits in progress. It's our aim to complete five of the eight audits that are currently in progress for the annual opinion for 21-22. So that means rolling over the remaining three audits to the next financial year. And apologies committee, because there is a, an error in your report on page 198 of your report packs. Um, I believe it says that we aim to complete six, but that is, that is five. Um, okay, so for the 27 audits we've completed and are reported in this, this update, we've got five follow-ups. One audit had a substantial assurance. 14 audits returned a reasonable or a reasonable grant certification assurance. Two were limited assurance and one was a limited grant certification. Three were advisory pieces of work and one was a special investigation. An outline of these audits with their assurance and their objective is detailed on pages 183 to 185 of your report packs. In the period covered by the report, uh, there were 16 priority two actions agreed across the following audits. That's pool cars, disaster recovery, green homes grant termination, the local authority test and trace support payment scheme funding grant termination and the Hereford City Centre Transport Package Special Investigation. A summary of the priority two actions along with their implementation dates are detailed on pages 186 to 189 of your report packs with the full uh, HCCTP summary report um, uh, appendix two that starts on page 211 of your report pack. Um, I am happy to take any questions regarding the priority two actions and SWAP today, we have got available uh, Jen Strahan, who is SWAP's principal ICT auditor. If there's any specific questions around the disaster recovery findings, so Jen is available today to answer those. During the period, there were no significant corporate risks identified. On on pages 190 and 191 of your report pack, you'll see we've completed five follow-up audits. The follow-up audits have identified there's one priority two action and three priority three actions in progress. The priority two action that's in progress relates to the debt recovery, sorry, the debt recovery policy and supporting procedure documents. And we were informed as part of that follow-up that that action will be completed by the 31st of May, 2022. In our progress report, we've continued to draw your attention to the thematic findings. And in this progress report, we've 
reported the continued thematic findings which relate to policy documents and procedure documents and data and spreadsheet management. And I think you saw that in the previous progress report that we brought to committee. There was a, a further thematic finding um, in this period uh, relating to the incons sorry, relating to the consistencies of grant coding for income and expenditure. Uh, but I just wanted to draw the committee's attention to the fact that we've done further work since that uh, finding was put in the progress report and all those actions relating to that finding have been completed. There are two changes to the plan since our previous update and we've had requests to complete the following audits, the Southwide Transport Package LEP settlement and the Revenue Grant Termination Protect and Vaccinate Grant Termination which has seen the rollover of two audits from this financial year's plan into next financial year's plan. And they are outlined on page 196 of your report pack. And then finally, just to give you a brief summary of the Hereford City Centre Transport Package. So as, as I said before, that's outlined on appendix two of your report pack, so pages 211 to 223. This was a special investigation, therefore an assurance opinion is not provided. One priority one action, eight priority two actions, and one priority three action were agreed as part of the audit. Page two of that report gives you a breakdown of the key findings, which include the lack of an original record of land to support the costs that were outlined in the business case, control weaknesses in budget reporting and financial monitoring across all governance levels with financial decisions being made in silo. We identified control weaknesses around contract management and processes relating to service orders and compensation events. There were weaknesses identified in action tracking and minute recording. We suggested improvements in the clarity in decision-making reports. And finally, the need for uh, prompt escalation of issues as and when they arise. The report provides a summary of the review of documentation and other evidence, as well as a summary of the meetings held with officers and councillors. And then Appendix 3 to that report then outlines the control weaknesses with their priorities and the actions that have, have been agreed with key officers across the council. All of the actions made as part of this investigation were agreed with officers. That's the end of my update and happy um, Jackie and I can now take any questions that you might have specifically around the reports that you've been presented with today. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> so before I uh, open uh, the floor to questions, what I think it, it's quite a meaty report today with um, 27 audits. So if we could possibly focus our initial questions on the bulk of the report, and then um, which covers pool cars, disaster recovery, green home brands, etc. And then once we've covered that part of the report, we can move on to the HCTTP, because I'm sure everyone has lots of questions on that as well. Um, that way we can cover off uh, the, the two areas of the report, I think, a bit more sort of <coughs> process. So if you're happy to, to proceed in that manner, if, if those members that may have questions on the bulk of the report first, please. Um, Councillor Matthews first. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd like to ask if you'd be so kind on page 188, Green Homes Grant, Unspent Grant. Can you tell us how much of is that unspent sum? And you say that the priority time scale is the 30th of April. What's the present position? So how much is involved in, in unspent money and, and what's the latest date, the latest uh, uh, issue, uh, you know, in respect of the time limit? Um, Amy, or Jackie, do you want to? Thank you for your question, Councillor Matthews. I'm just trying to dig out that exact figure for you. Um, of the amount to be repaid. I have it here. Um, so Herefordshire is set to return 497,000 uh, pounds of funding to the government. In relation to the updated position, because as you correctly point out that um, 
time scale has now passed i'd have to come back to you with an update uh from officers if that's okay i can come back to you come back to committee with that information does that mean that we will lose that money my understanding is the money will be returned to central government yes councillor matthews Thank you, Amy. Just two questions. One, I don't, I don't see any but 106 money, so uh, perhaps uh, we can get some more information. If it's being noted on 106 money, I understand there's, we've been looking at we've been looking at it because of the uh, parish councils complaining of spend, uh, but I don't see anything in this report. I'm not sure if it's ongoing or not. The other thing is, this is all very interesting, but I'd like something that's going to be um, that residents can understand. This is all legal legal talk, which is great for councils, perhaps. But I would suggest the majority of uh, residents are much like myself. We have trouble with legal jargon, and uh, we'd like to see stuff in black and white. So if we can make some of this stuff in black and white, then and close out the grey areas, which is quite a few of, perhaps it would help us, help our residents understand what we're doing here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Summers. I think Action 103 on that action log covers um, an update on Section 106 okay. um, and with links to the report. So that's something that um, you can maybe look at. Now. But if you need further information on that, we can, I'm sure we can. Um, one of your officers can get you the report information. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the elements of the report that um, you would like clarity on, are there, are there specific points that you'd like to raise so that maybe can clarify for you? Just general, the, the media in Herefordshire seems to make quite a few mistakes when they're reporting, and perhaps that those mistakes are because of a lot of the legal stuff that's uh, that's in it, and they don't they don't have the qualifications. So perhaps we could do it for them, is what I'm saying, because uh, I've noticed like in the Hereford Times there's been all kinds of stuff in there, but half of it, or a quarter of it anyway, doesn't really stand up, doesn't stack up, and I think we need to make sure that they're getting the message right. Anyway, that's just my feeling. Thank Sorry, you. I should have used the mic. I didn't Thank you, Councillor Summers. Any other questions, Councillor Jinman? Yes, thank you. Can you just be a little clearer as to what your terms of reference are for your Q4 audits on page 196? Um, Southwide Transport Package, LEP Settlement, Revenue Grant. Can you just be a little clearer as to, as to what, what is the extent of that audit? Is it purely the settlement or do, will it actually engage with the whole of the process of the Southwide uh, programme? Maybe Thank you, Councillor Jinman. Specifically, the Southwide Transport Package LEP settlement, it, it is just as you said, it, it, the scope is the LEP settlement arrangements. I'm slightly uncomfortable that, given the nature of the next report that we're going to deal with, that by defining it in such a tight way, we might not learn some rather important lessons with regard to the whole of that uh, particular uh, episode. And I would have hoped that that could have been broadened to have understood a little bit more about the whole of that process. I would suggest from this committee that it's something that we ought to be asking um, is undertaken so that we have clarity as to the whole of that project because at the moment, I think it must be doubt, given the nature of the following report with regard to the, uh, the, the matters of the road in, the, in Hereford itself. So I'm, I'm uncomfortable that we're not taking that into a broader context. Second point I'd just like to raise with you is there are a remarkable number of points that appear in your audit report <coughs> which I look at and go, why wasn't this picked up earlier? It, it seems to me that some of the, and this will, I'll be making exactly the same comment when it comes to the annual uh, report, uh, because I'm, I'm noticing things here where there must have been previous uh, internal reports, never mind external ones, 
And there's some revelations, shall we say, within them, where you're thinking, well, if you do, a, do an in-depth or even a, uh, a reasonably in-depth audit, how come these items suddenly turn up X years later without them not being seen at the time? Is there a, a underrunning problem here of being able to access data? Or is it one of um, lack of clarity in terms of terms of reference in the first place? Thank you, Councillor Jim, for your question. Apologies, what I should have said when I answered your first question about South Bay Transport Package is we did do two pieces of work around the South Bay Transport Package, and I might have to come back to committee with the exact dates, but I believe they were 1920 with follow up pieces of work done in 2021. But let me just clarify those dates for you, and I'll come back to committee. Um, but yeah, we did do two pieces of work around that project with two pieces of follow up work as well. In relation to your second question, have you got any specific examples of potentially where you where you think perhaps we could have picked up work earlier? It's quite difficult to answer the question. I appreciate that, and I probably will come to various points along the way. But I mean, the classic example in here was that we've been contracting, and this is in the external one, admittedly, but we seem to have been contracting with a company that didn't exist for a number of years. And I find that quite extraordinary that that um, decision, i.e. about the BT, I forgot what its particular title is now, but I did find myself reading this going, how come this, this has been going on for the number of years it has? and has not been seen by internal, by SWAP, by internal review, or external. That's one example, but there will be others I'm sure we'll come across as we go through detailed uh, consideration. And I think that, continuing on from that, Councillor Jim, and as I, I feel like I'm a broken record, because I think every committee meeting, we've, we've had a large focus on grants and grant work, and I'm, and from an assurance perspective, I'm growing more concerned about um, the, the amount of time that internal audit is spending on all the other work that the council is doing. And that that's certainly one point that um, I wanted to raise as well. So if I could carry on up after that point, but um, I just wanted to make sure that Ben recorded um, Councillor Jimman's point about the, the LEP review recommendation potentially so we can discuss it at the end once we've discussed the um, HCCTP audit. It, um, it may be that bringing together the parts that have already been looked at along with that that we will have an overarching picture but I think it's something that we need to be in the position of having the equivalent of that which occurs in the other uh, swap report regarding the uh, Hereford City Centre transport. Yeah thank you. So just um, delving a little bit further um, on this point, um, I've got a number of questions um, and I don't, I, I see Councillor Bart that you've, you've got your hand up in, as well. So I'll come to you in a second. But this first question was on, on sort of the work, we've got 27 audits reported here, 22 general audits and five follow-ups, um, 14 grants reviews and four more some general audits with or other audits altogether. So the two, gen the four general audits, two had reasonable assurance and two didn't. So, um, you know, 50%. So of the, the other work that we looked at, other than the grant work, um, you know, 50% of it has got some level of assurance and 50% of it has limited assurance. And that does concern me a little bit um, in terms of, leading to our overall assurance opinion. Um, so I just wanted to, to, to get your views on that, um, Amy or, or, or Jackie. Um, also, I wanted to understand, um, once again, I feel like a broken record, the costs of these grant audits. Um, are these costs coming out of our internal order budget or are these being covered by the, the grant funding that we're getting from government? Because I know, last time in our last meeting we were saying we we're moving further away from grant audits but I still see it's taking up the bulk of our time um, and the bulk of your efforts and I'm just concerned that the rest of our 
organization is not getting ad adequate um, internal work coverage. So if you're able to respond to that, I'd appreciate it. Please. Um, thank you, Kath. Obviously, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, so in relation to the report that's before you today, you are correcting that there has been a significant amount of grant work um, due to, obviously, and I think we've discussed this before, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the additional grant funding the council has been given, there is a requirement that the grant has to be signed off by the chief internal auditor as well as the chief exec. So that does require us to do work in those areas. Um, it has um, resulted in a significant amount of our time being spent on grant work and the time has come out of the internal audit plan. What I would say is all the work we've done around grants will feed into the annual opinion. Obviously the council are distributing significant sums of money and it's important to ensure that those sums of money are distributed in the right way and also meet the criteria of grant funding. We are hopeful that in the next financial year, or well, this financial year, that the amount of funding for grants may, may reduce. So the requirements on our time will reduce the grant work and we'll be able to give more focus to other internal audit work. Thank you, Jackie. And um, perhaps Section 151 officer might like to respond to the, the point on the funding. Thank you, Chair. And as Jackie said, we have to have these audits carried out in terms of uh, the terms of the grant from government. Some of them will come with what they call new burdens, which is a contribution to the council's costs. I think it's fair to say we've discussed before that probably isn't the full cost of administration's grants. It's a contribution to what? So we are receiving some of a contribution to our overall cost, which will include part of the cost of the internal audit program. Does that potentially mean that we could carry forward some internal audit budget into the new year and undertake more internal audit work on the areas that have perhaps received less attention as a result? Uh, we could. Um, we haven't done to date in terms of closing the account. We'll certainly take that away and have a look at it. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bartlett, would you like to ask your questions? Thank you. Um, and in, in fact, you, you, you've just covered quite a lot of what I wanted to ask um, about the uh, grant funding. Uh, other than so, I'd really, I'm quite pleased to see that we're actually getting to the end now of of, of all of these um, grant fundings, uh, reasonable certifications, because they seem to have taken up a huge amount of our, our time just recently. And I'm just, as we've said before, mindful of the fact that our work programme on audits are going backwards. The, um, the only one that I wanted to ask about that's finished, really, is the Oral Health Needs Assessment Plan, which has been given the advisory assurance uh, for, given that the state, the, the um, problems that we've got with finding dentists at the moment to carry out NHS work, I'd be quite interested if we, if it's, if we're able to get some more information on that report, and and also whether or not um, this needs to be, oral health needs to be moved forward through one of the other directorates. Um, I'm just conscious of the fact that, as well as from personal experience, uh, that the, um, sorry, I'm looking for some notes and I'm trying to multitask on the computer and I'm serious, I'm not making a very good job of it. So, but, but just basically some uh, extra information on the oral health needs assessment plan, presumably that's finished now, that's, uh, it'd be interesting to see the findings if we're a, if that's possible. And um, where does that report go now? Please, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Um, Amy, would you like to respond, please? Thank you, Councillor Bartlett, for your question. And I can relate to juggling the screens and the documents, so you're not alone there. Um, with the oral health needs assessment uh, report was done as um, an advisory piece of work, although might be worth explaining to committee that it was um, almost a follow-up. So 
what we did was followed up on the recommendations that were made in that area. So I can definitely um, have a discussion with Ben and Andrew perhaps and see what could be shared with you in terms of further information or um, potentially the report perhaps. Thank you. Um, and, and whether or not there were any recommendations for that work to be taken or things to be taken forward from that. Councillor Barlow, we, we didn't make any additional recommendations ourselves from SWAP. We just reported on the progress of the ones that were in place, but I'm, I'm sure um, we can get some further detail to you after this committee meeting, if that's okay with you. Thank you. And can I just ask, and I'm not quite sure if this is Amy or Jackie, but it's listed as an advisory audit as opposed to a follow-up audit. So could you just, um, is, is there a difference? I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Jackie might want to um, add to it as well. I think that the main difference, Councillor Balderson, is that it's not a it's not a follow up of a swap audit. That would be my interpretation of the difference. So whereas our normal follow ups would be the follow up work of the work we've previously done, this was follow up um, of actions that were made by another um, from another assurance uh, process. Does does that make sense? Have I explained that well? I think so, yes, thank you. Thanks. Um, Councillor Matthew. Very brief, <coughs> Chairman, uh, either Jackie or Hamie. Under the pool cars, it says the audit identified there were missing vehicle mileage sheets and recharges since April 2019. Action was agreed to identify all available uh, mileage sheets, etc. Looking and reading at this, it seems, you know, quite concerned about the way this is managed. Can you tell me how widespread these vehicle mileage sheets, et cetera, you found to be out of order? Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Unfortunately, I have to come back to you with that detail. I don't have that detail to hand, but I can certainly provide it after the committee as to what the scope of the audit was. So what the years were and when the missing mileage sheets spanned, if that's what you're looking for. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions. Does anybody else have any more questions? Uh, Councillor Timman. Yeah, a general question, really, just to, to, to our finance officer. I mean, we've just made the comments about the number of grants that we receive. It seems the style of central government these days is increasingly to provide or competition for grants for councils to try to achieve. And then not only do they do that, but they then also put in the requirement that you've got to audit it all. Is there therefore a need to start to shift the way in which we have to work to accommodate the very fact, as has been pointed out by our chair just now, that we're, we're doing so much grant work, but that's actually a consequence of the manner by which central government wishes local government to work and if that's the pattern is that something we're just going to have to grow to be used to it might be an answer it might be a question also for swap i might because you have the advantage of looking at other councils and uh, and other areas working with different systems thank you chair i'm i think there's a distinction between the grants for the covid and the pandemic arrangements and other things uh, the pandemic grants, it's unprecedented, we have a very large amount of money to distribute and government uh, defined the rules for those. And quite often, we lived through it, they would, those rules were changing almost on a daily, if not weekly basis. So um, the, the work you're seeing here is, is the audit work on those type of grants. Uh, but you make a very valid point that the current arrangement for Westminster is that we tend to have to bid for uh, additional money. So we've got the Stronger Towns Fund, which we had to bid for, £22 million coming into the government under the Section 31 grant, which I'm sure when we get those details in the summer, we'll have an audit requirement. We've got things like levelling up shared prosperity, which is very much the way that the government is allocating money to uh, councils. We've had the arrangements on the bus, which, which we didn't do too well. Uh, so I think that it's a valid question that probably this committee and the work planning would swap. There will be more audits of grants into the future something around these one-off arrangements, we need to take into account for our um, 
Sean's process and how this committee operates. And it's certainly in the conversation I've had with SWAP about their work program. It, is, it seems to be the new normal in terms of dealing with government. Can follow up if I may. Uh, one of the issues with regard to these bidding processes seems to be that there's quite a considerable amount of work has to be put in by council. It has to come from general revenue in order to bid for something which you then might not get. If you get it, you seem to get some of the costs of the bid back. Is that, am I being too sweeping in statement or is that a, that's the impression I'm getting. So it becomes really very expensive if you don't get the, the, the uh, bid being successful. <clears throat> I wouldn't disagree with that. I think my colleagues will have a view as well. So, I, I think, if I may, yeah, I think we should get used to the fact that this is the, the future funding opportunities through government are going to be with and through individual funding opportunities. I think at the last count, there was over 100 that were available to, to local government. Um, some of them um, attract um, additional support for bid submission. If, for example, the levelling up fund opportunities prior to the current round, Herefordshire was a priority one, priority two area. Um, we moved up recently to being a priority one area. And with that, we were um, allocated, I think, just over £125,000 worth of funding to support our bidding process. So in certain instances, there is funding provided to support the development of high quality bids, um, you know, hopefully, which you know, doesn't guarantee but allows us to be more successful and, and invest in the skills that are required to put bits forward. I think the reality for me and for, for, um, for Andrew and for us that we talked about is the council will need to get you know, more sophisticated at funding applications. You know, we have a, a good track record. There's more for us to do in terms of our funding bits coming together. And one of the things we are looking at now is how we bring that expertise together in one team across the council so we can work in children's, in economy, and in adults. Um, but we've got a, a core skill set which allows us to use that team corporately for a greater success across the council. Thank you. One question obviously arises from that is, is the adequacy of the grant funding in order to achieve a bid? Um, you said you get sometimes some monies. Does that meet the actual cost of those bids? as a generality. And it would seem then that SWAP is gonna to have to, at some stage, do uh, an in-depth view of the processes uh, involved in these big uh, ways of doing things. As a generality, as I mean, I don't think that we ever recover our investment in the bidding process through, um, through, the, through um, the grants which are available. Invariably, some of these things are, are at risk, <coughs> some of them, uh, if we're not successful, we, we retain the work that we've done, whether it's the research to support a project or the initiative, but when those funding opportunities come around or another time and we can bring those initiatives together and bring them forward again. And you know, the, the work that we do as an investment as we see it in terms of the, the improvements and developments that we want to see. And it's, you know, it's then being patient and timely around where the funding opportunities may come through. <coughs> An example of which is, you know, the Market Town Investment Plans, which set out a programme of, of, of initiatives, schemes and new projects. And we will bring those forward as funding streams come together is an example of that work. Chair, could I just ask uh, Mr. Lovell a short question, please? Yeah, um, if you could tell me, because this Green Home scheme, where we push a million... Uh, Half a million pound back to government. We shouldn't be returning money when we get it. Can you tell me what went wrong there that we found ourselves in that position? Uh, thank you, Council Matters. I'm not sure it's what went wrong. I, I, one of the challenges that all councils are facing with this greenhouse grant is us finding the appropriate contractors who have the right qualifications to deliver so this, and finding households who want to have it uh, the work carried out. So. Um, we failed to find enough of both of those in this round. What is happening, we return the money back to government and they then reissue it to councils in the next grant. So uh, the money does come back to, to local government, so we do get the money back, but you're, you're right, I know that's not the way to do things, but that's the reality of how governments are, 
writing these programs, they have very tight timetables or have done to date. So that makes it quite difficult to find a contractor who's got capacity in their work program and a household who meets the criteria and within a very narrow window of time. So it is one of the challenges that we're facing along with all councils. But it, it, it's not how we do doing business, but we, we have to follow what government does. Yeah, our money is so tight at the moment, as I say, it hurts a little bit to say, send it back the way I thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matthews. Uh, as Councillor Summers, Councillor Andrews, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll move on to HCCTP, if that's okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, you'll, you'll have to, I apologize if this is somewhere in the report, but I can't find it. We have quite an extensive asset portfolio. I've raised this matter in previous times. Um, it seems to be depreciating rather than appreciating, which is which is kind of strange when it comes to um, property values. Um, but I can understand why, because the state of our, of our assets are in pretty poor shape generally. Um, is there any place in this, this this paper that tells us the value of what we have and what needs doing to it to bring it to what it should be? Um, I, I understand it. It's done every year, but uh, each asset is checked for, for value, etc. Um, but I don't see anything. Uh, can you help me on this one? Um, uh, I'm very happy to pick up. It's not in this report because swap don't do audits of okay. our asset conditions or our asset values. The, the value of assets is part of the annual accounts that gets audited by clients every year, and we have to value. Uh, asset portfolio. A lot of those valuations are on things like existing use valuation, yeah. prescribed ways of calculating the value. So that the, the value of those assets comes to this committee and with the accounts. In terms of the condition of the assets, your colleagues on scrutiny have asked those type of questions. So there are condition yeah, yeah, surveys where we appoint yeah. experts to go around and assess what works need to be done on our buildings and our assets. And then there is a work program which forms part of the budget proposal that comes through to the sort of the council to approve. Uh, you know, we have a very diverse and very complicated asset portfolio. So the, the long-term repairs are quite extensive, as you can imagine. And we have a lot of complicated buildings we need to do. We know Shah Hall, for example, um, that stood there for over 200 years. It's now at the point where it needs some work done on the roof. So we have a lot of vintage properties, if that's the right place as well. But it's uh, your colleagues in scrutiny uh, seeing those details. So that's why it's not in this report. Yeah, I should probably stop there as it's not in the report, but I just, it is an issue for me, and we don't seem to be getting anywhere on it. Uh, you know, the people that are, that are supposed to be doing the job of checking the value of these assets, I know what work, you know, how much the asset portfolio is, portfolio is worth, actually worth, uh, well, it's, it's probably written down somewhere, but I haven't seen it, I haven't I've been searching for it, as you know, I've been concerned about this for some time. So in the future, if it's possible that we can, that councillors can be given information on our asset portfolio in black and white again, um, so we can understand it. And what are we do, do, gonna do about it? Because obviously we've got some major issues here. And um, you know, we sold off assets, which should have perhaps been done to update our assets we, we kept. So anyway, there is seem to be an asset problem and I think it's costing an awful lot of money. And if we borrow money to do it, inter interest rates are going up. So, you know, it's just something I'd like to see in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Summers. And I think in the next few months, uh, all the scrutiny committees will be revising their work program. So that's probably something that you can feed in through that process to be sure they're okay with that. Yeah. Councillor Andrews. Thank you. I'm going to take you back questions if I can. So, in sort of support for Councillor Matthews and Councillor Jinman. Their questions about the funding and where we're chasing grants. So, a couple of questions on how do you assess what are the right funds to go and chase? So, if I use your example of the greenhouses, so you chase the funds, you secure the monies, you start to spend it, and then you find out the contract is not available for you to spend the rest of the money. At the very beginning of chasing that fund, what sort of audits and checks do we do to check that we're actually ever going to be able to spend that money? Because a bit like giving you a false hope. So the government tells you you can go and spend this money, and we say yes, we'll spend it, and then we find out that we can't, which wastes effort, wastes all the effort and intelligence you've done to go and do it. You get very little reward from it. So within chasing your funding and your grants of it, how are you validating the efforts and rewards of what you're going to get back? 
so we know that average you're chasing the right box actually when you get a success you see you spend it you actually can spend it and as councillor matthew says if you win a million pounds you should spend a million pounds definitely and never give any of it back so you should always be finding enough resources to spend that money now i know in some projects you have to again apply and say what you spend the money on so you just can't spend it on jelly babies when it's meant to be for roofing tiles i know that so however you should be able to spend all the money for the validation of your project you have made so i don't know how you answer that question but, uh, if you give me the best effort i'll be appreciated okay. thank you uh, do my best to uh, answer uh, we have a mixed economy of power right? so there are some as we've just spoke we have to chase very hard it's a very competitive process you have to put um, your, your best option for Herefordshire to government and, and they will then decide. And some of those decisions are, um, uh, I think, made by ministers rather than on the hard evidence. Using the green homes example, but that's in a slightly different position. Government allocates money to each council across them as an allocation method. So we don't have to bid for that. They say, congratulations, you've been awarded X pounds. And by the way, you've got to spend it within this amount of money. So, but that's the difference on the green homes by this time. It isn't the one to try to identify appropriate contractors. Uh, and there is work in what we'll see in the uh, annual plan arrangement. The way of trying to educate and train up a contractor resource within the county so we have a knowledge base and a skill base within our uh, building community to do this work. One of the challenges they face, they've got more than enough work to do on their other things. So it's quite a challenge for them to increase the supply chain. So it was quite a complicated situation, but using the example of the green homes, we didn't have to bid for that. There was a government process to allocate that to each and every part. That's cool, thank you. So one of the gaps they see there then is, I still think it's how our estimation is of risks that we've got. So again, chasing, you know, you're given the money, brilliant, if you get it, excellent. Then the risk of us being able to turn that over into a viable project and a success criteria to make it happen. And I don't know how you do within your scope of works now, how you evaluate the success criteria that the Herbert Council will have in returning those around. And again, I bring you back down to effort versus reward. You can spend a lot of focus doing something that gives you minimal reward. I want to see how we're going to, how you evaluate that really. And I know you're not going to answer me, but I appreciate that. But it is an element that I want you to just come back maybe up to this group again and say, we've got all these projects. These are the ones we really think we can nail. We want 100 100 deliver on a long time and pause. I use my other ones, and you can exhaust all that money because but if you look through all these projects, I'm seeing either you overspend money you didn't have, or we have money making it back, or we're, or we're not achieving what we want. So you need to get better success criteria through that, which starts with the evaluation of what we're trying to achieve. Now, I don't know if that is using the, the audit and government's team you've got, which is great, it is one giving the scope to go and do it. If not, how can we try and find that so you can perform better? Or a sweetening topic. There are plenty of options, yes. And I think as Paul described, moving to the corporate bid team and the resources there, that, that's how we will deal with some of those issues. Thank you. Great. I've got two more questions and then we'll move on to HCTTP. And um, the first one is in relation to the disaster recovery report. Um, this rather concerned me um, in terms um, of our current, the current climate of um, uh, in, in other councils and in, in Russia and Ukraine. Um, and, uh, you know, I see there's issues with application master lists not being up to date and not being recorded with the service level agreement systems may not be covered by the service level agreement and we're unsure of the backup process. Um, there's an indication that uh, where that it would be reviewed when contract terms are due for renewal, but is that in a couple of years time? Is that in a couple of weeks or a couple of months? Um, so uh, I was rather concerned about this and I, and I don't know, um, I would see this as quite a significant risk to the council, um, at least on our should be on our corporate register, or at least on our um, on the on the significant risk register that is being developed by the management board. So um, I just wanted to get a bit, a bit more information in terms of um, 
the work that's being done around disaster recovery and whether this is something that really needs to come back to audit and governance committee for um, further information for further details. So I'm not quite sure if that's section 151 or SWAP that would like to respond to that. Well, Joe, I'm happy to start that, that response if, if that helps. And I think, as you say, that globally, the world has changed significantly. And um, around IT and disaster recovery, I think we, we do need to make sure that we look that through the lens of risk. And that I, I, we're in your hands as to, to whether you want to bring it back to the committee, but I uh, see the logic in that, and that making sense for us to come back. We clearly have some work to do that we've agreed to do in these, these programs. But I think what you're alluding to is a more in depth look at the arrangements. And I think. You know, if the committee wants, uh, which is that, then we're very happy to support that. Uh, whether we need to do a bit more of a deep dive into this particular issue, because I think it's quite a significant risk, um, or whether we wait to see, um, hopefully in September, with our new Paul Harris, <laughs> um, if we see the new strategic risk register, whether we, we delve into it at that point, I'm not quite sure what um, committee's feelings are on that. I think you make a very important point there of waiting for a person. Disaster recovery should never be person dependent. It should actually happen and be a process that's regularly practiced and we know it's going to work, irrespective of who's ill on the day. So from my point of view, your point is well made in the first instance. This is something that it would be sensible to have a proper review and given the world circumstances at the moment, um, of some uh, concern that it's not allowed to uh, go on for too long because uh, it might be needed rather sooner than later. Yes, um, Councillor I'm not making any remarks to the officers at the moment, but anytime you have a changeover, there's a lag in, in information passing on. And sometimes there's no information passed on. Uh, it just gets lost in the ether. So, I think as soon as possible would be would be better. And, and as Peter said, waiting for someone else is just actually that you can they can come on board, and it might be six months before they get a, a hand, handle on it. So then we're you know not we're not moving forward. We're just taking three steps back every time. So one step forward, three steps back. So I would agree. Thank Chairman, you. If, if I may, um, assurance that the the role is currently out for advertisement at the moment. Um, and secondly, that, that last week's corporate leadership team meeting, we had an update on the strategic risk register and the work that we needed to do to bring back the report to yourselves in September, which took a more strategic perspective in terms of those risks which the council faces um, and perhaps not fully reflected in the current um, corporate risk register. So you're mindful that's an important piece of work for us. And I think it's very much part of raising the profile of risk management um, across the organisation, which is an important part of the work that we need to do. Um, so it becomes a standing item within the director leadership team meetings in terms of the updating the local risk registers. And then that strategic risk register update with the corporate leadership team. Um, and we've agreed that we need to have a workshop event that looks at refreshing that strategic risk register, looking about impact and likelihood in particular not, not the anecdotal things that we think might go wrong, but let's assess these based on a, you know the impact and likelihood of those happening. And where does that take us in terms of the important strategic risk that we need to focus on? I think recall from the last meeting that perhaps one role for the committee would be to take some of those strategic risks and have a closer look at them. Um, and, and, I think be an and I think that would be an, an important piece of work. And you know, part of, one of those maybe did act him up did. But like disaster recovery, um, for example, an, or an element of that in terms of how we would respond to a particular cyber attack. Okay, um, so perhaps um, an action then for maybe Section 151 officer to work with you, Ben, and Councillor Shaw to determine how best to reflect um, <coughs> the, the concerns we have around disaster recovery in the work program. It's okay. Chair, could I ask the Chief Executive, sorry to budge in. Uh, um, I asked you the last meeting about taking back our thoughts and recommendations to cabinet, because in my humble opinion, the cabinet member should be responsible for that directorate. And if it's highlighting certain risks, they should be asking that directorate to give them monthly, six weekly 
updates of what they're doing to address that risk. Did you take it back and what sort of response did you get? Yeah, we had a conversation um, at the corporate leadership team and we've had a conversation with um, the cabinet members around risk management uh, on the back of the work that we've done so far. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to do is where we focus on those direct risk registers, for example, economy and environment, not only because you know, Ross is sat to my left, then as, as the update that comes through Ross's directorate, that will be then fed into the cabinet member briefings that follow that. Um, and that then for, that will then become part of the strategic risk register if there are, if there are significant strategic risks over and above what's in the directorate. Um, and everybody wants to play their part in terms of how we manage risk. Yeah, but as cabinet members, that's their sole and main responsibility to make sure you deliver value for money and they are answerable for their, make sure their directors deliver. And if not, they should be approaching you to make sure that they do. And absolutely, the starting point of that is the briefing that, you know, Ross, as one of the, as the corporate director for economy and environment, will deliver for the cabinet members within that directorate, highlighting the particular risks and then talk, taking them through what the mitigations are to address those risks. And that becomes part of the programme going forward as an ongoing discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. My last question is around the thematic findings, um, Amy and Jackie. So I, um, I think it's great that you're reporting back to us now some of these thematic findings that you're, um, that, that you're finding across all the audits that you're doing. One of the things that um, I just wanted to close the loop on, um, many of the thematic findings that you've reported today are coming out through priority three findings, so it wouldn't necessarily be reported to us. Um, um, and I guess when you're coming up with these thematic, or when you're identifying these thematic findings and maybe some other best practice improvements that, and I think we have talked about this in previous meetings, um, where you don't necessarily have a specific recommendation that will fall into any of our action trackers. I just want to understand how this information is being used um, and whether it's um, there's a process for it to say go to the transformation director to um, because at the moment I feel like there's a risk that it's going to be lost. We, we get it in this report and then we don't think about it again. Um, so I just wanted to understand how you're using these thematic findings and how that's being fed back into the council to ensure we make the most of what you're finding and also your best practice um, elements that you're identifying. Thank you, Councillor Bolson. Um, thank you, Councillor Bolson. Sorry, Jackie, go on. It's okay. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Bolson. Um, just to say that the thematic findings are fed back through the council. Um, the um, corporate leadership team see the progress reports before they come through to the audit and governance committee. So the thematic findings are discussed at those meetings. Um, in relation to the fi thematic findings that are in the report already, um, as you will be aware, one of those has already found itself into the way into the audit plan for next year. So um, we're doing our very best to make sure that, that, that those are very much top of the focus um, and that the council are aware of those thematic findings. And if we can do work around those areas, um, we will be doing some work around those areas um, in the next audit plan. Great, thanks, Jackie. So it's primarily driving the, the pipeline, I guess, of audits that we're going to start seeing from, next, um, from our next meeting. That, that's correct. It will definitely um, feed into the pipeline of audits. I'm not going to say that every thematic finding will feed in, will, will form an audit, um, but obviously that, that they will be discussed and where appropriate those thematic findings will feed into to an audit in, in the pipeline of audits um, for the next financial year. Great, thank you. So um, on that point then, I think we move on to the next chunky part of the internal audit report which is HCTTP report. So any members wish to um, ask questions? Yeah. <laughs> Councillor Matthew, you Yes, I'll, I'll start off. Yeah, I'm a bit shy this morning. Um, 
what it is, uh, Chairman, you're well aware that it was obvious to myself and Councillor Jinman, he was sat alongside me when I was leader of the independence and for eight years and a very strong opposition group at the time. Um, I've said this before and I'll keep repeating it in the 15-16 budget, it showed an expenditure to date of 19.8 million. The following year, 1617, it showed 10 million. And when I cleared this with the Section 151 officer then, of course, and it was and the cabinet member, and it, they looked at me as if I was speaking in some foreign language, which I do sometimes. Um, and, and to me, the writing was on the wall then. There was a, a obvious failing of proper management. And, and if that had been seized on then, and handled properly, we wouldn't have been in the mess that we're in today. I reported those findings to the external auditors, <clears throat> and Mr. Jones was the IC then, and, and uh, he came back to me uh, and we had meetings, a lengthy discussion, and he sent a very strong recommendation to the council that we adopt this senior management of capital projects. and. Uh, Mr. Lavro can confirm what I've said because I've show, shown him the reports and gone through it before. Um, <clears throat> I don't know why, but that never really seemed to work. Although the uh, council, uh, the council uh, officially approved that approach, uh, um, I don't know why it wrong. But obviously, something seriously went wrong, which shows us, uh, um, which has landed us in the unfortunate mess we are today. Uh, so, you know, I just wanted to point out that it was highlighted at an early stage and, 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 uh, uh, and the external auditors were made aware of it and they made recommendations. So really, somebody should have got a grip of things then. The only thing I'd add to that, uh, Chair, is that when you're dealing with compulsory purchase, that can always be complicated unless you get it very, very carefully assessed in the initial stages. So you can allow for a little bit of flexibility there. So I can understand how the costs fluctuated to a certain extent. But it's sad, really, after we've gone to the trouble of uh, highlighting these issues and getting, it, getting the external auditors onto it, that, that our suggestions and, suggestions and their recommendations weren't uh, strictly adhered to. And that also leads, you know, to a wider governance issue in terms of if, if as say an opposition member, you're raising some of these concerns. Um, for me as well, we do have structures in place for say for scrutiny or for um, members to call in specific decisions um, and that didn't happen. So, and I don't know whether that is, um, that is something that requires more member training to, to, to understand how, that they can, they can do that. Um, that's, I mean, that's something that, that's drawn, drawn to my attention. And I think part of the, the rethinking governance work that we've been doing, we're looking at trying to um, engage more long-term in the, the forward plan so we can pick up some of these points and, and have more, say, a, a task and finish group that can really delve into the details and really scrutinise things in a more strategic manner. And, but maybe there's this issue of the call. We, I, I mean, I don't think we've had very many call-ins at all on any decisions, and whether that's a, a training issue that needs to be picked up by the member development team, um, that's, that's something that perhaps um, we need to follow up on. Chair, perhaps you know, I'm not aware what the exact remit is of external auditors. I would have thought, having made a recommendation like that and seen what had happened, that they would have closely monitored that on the follow-up years to make sure it was being dealt with, you know. Maybe and, section one five one officer can and, and, and it would appear that that didn't happen. But uh, uh, you know, it, it's um, it, it's sad, really, you know, to find this council, you know, in, in this situation when I'm sure if stronger and more positive action had been taken at that time, it would have addressed the situation. Chair, I, know, I don't think I'm in a position to um, comment on what Grant Forms did or didn't do. Though I know they are independent, so that they're um, they accountable for their actions. But I have had a number of conversations with Councillor Matthews about this and the, uh, you know, who's outlined 
Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry, Chairs John Roberts, Grant Thornton. I've, I've got my hand raised on the Zoom call. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, if, if I might uh, interject at, at this point to, to, to help with, with the understanding of what the external audit did, and, and it's something that I was going to refer to in my um, presentation on the auditor's annual report later. So uh, shortly after the matter was raised by my predecessor, Mr. Jones, I, I, I took over the, the role um, of the external audit lead at the audit. And the matter of capital governance has been the feature of our audit work and our audit reports ever since um, that time. And it's also um, an area where we've sort of worked with uh, SWAP as, as they've been doing uh, reports as well in, um, in allied areas to that. And, and both external audit and internal audit have, have you know, raised uh, various recommendations of various significance around the broad area of capital governance um, ever since that point. So, so it, it's a point well made really as to how those recommendations land and, and drive um, and drive improvement forward. For example, um, members will recall last year's audit, our value for money audit was actually qualified in this area. So, so that is consistent with the, um, with the level of sort of a significant finding uh, that, that we reported last year. Um, and also this year, there's, there's um, a, a key recommendation raised around a significant value for money weakness in that area. So again, um, all consistent thematic points, all um, emanating from, from, that, um, from that original starting point. And I think we're seeing that across scrutiny as well. We had issues where action items were raised and not necessarily followed through. We're all, none of us are legacy um, audit committee members, but at least without governance arrangements that we have in place now, if recommendations are raised by external audit or internal audit, they do go into an action tracker. And we, as the audit committee, um, follow that action tracker through to completion. So the controls that we have in place now um, uh, should hopefully prevent that from happening in the future. Councillor Jinman. Yes, uh, thank you. I, I do think we have to try to look forwards, uh, learning from looking backwards. Uh, I think it's really important that uh, this was done, this piece of work, I think it, I'm right in saying it was asked for by the uh, Describe him still as new chief exec, but I think he's getting sort of beyond the sort of honeymoon period of being new. But I think he particularly asked for this piece of work to be done. And I think that therein, uh, there are a lot of lessons in here, some of which, unfortunately, those of us who've been around a little bit longer will remember a thing called Blue School Street. And we'll remember that there were issues there that were promises made, things would never happen again in the same way, etc. Well, I think we will now supplant that in our memory banks by having this particular HCCTP uh, one as the, the lessons learned. And I suppose the most important thing about it is how we make sure that we do learn those lessons, how we have a governance structure, an audit structure uh, that allows us to ensure we don't do it again. I mean, I am still sort of somewhat amazed that we, we, we don't seem to have got records of very things that you as an individual or in a business, you'd be constantly wondering you know, why isn't there a record of the land, the original land and associated costs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, it's sort of, sure. yeah, there are various aspects of this which beg a belief, but the fact remains there are new people, new faces, new team, new events, learn from the old and let's get it right. Um, because I wouldn't wish somebody in the future to be sitting here saying, why didn't they do when we were sitting in those chairs? So we've got to get it right. Um, we can't claw back some of these situations. I think the only important thing, perhaps question in a way, and I, I'm just wondering about finance officers can answer it, is how much money if we get to pay out on solving this particular problem of HCCTP? I mean, presumably, or well, I get the impression, there are still monies owed. Is that a fair comment? In terms of the deliverables, that the project's not concluded, so the report that went to Cabinet last year made that very clear. That the expectation is from the design work for the, the, the um, bus interchange and the like is included. There will be an expectation we need to come back and ask for more money. We're, we're not at that point of 
and doing that work. Yeah, so that that's ongoing. And I think again reported in that paper some of the arrangements for the comprehensive purchase arrangements <coughs> are still in progress. So we have land tribunal arrangements in place. So they will run their course, and that may involve the council having to pay more money than they originally thought. So that there are still a number of moving parts on this project. Um, we're not there in terms of delivering the, the nine deliverables, which is part of the official business case. So the um, it was delivered on time and on budget. It's starting to look a rather hollow comment at the time, isn't it? It's clearly quite a lot more that yet to be done, and that's going to have to be funded by <coughs> other means if it's going to be completed, from what you've just said. And I think I'd like just to um, push a little bit further on one of the comments that Councillor Zinman made in terms of, I mean, scope five of, of the audit was to review compliance in light of blue school house. Um, but I'm just trying to get everything, there's just so much, so much information. Um, a lot of these events for HCTTP occurred physically before Blue School House. Um, so, um, so I was just trying to better understand and maybe um, Amy or, or Jackie can um, help me understand, is it in terms of that scope five, um, because all this happened before Blue School House, you know, what value are we getting out of, of that of that part of the scope of the report? <clears throat> and also, um, it, I mean, at least it is great to see that many of the recommendations have, have been completed already. Um, but, and I, and I know we talked about this, you know, a, a couple of years ago, but in terms of moving as many projects on the Verto and following the new project process, um, initially, HCTTP wasn't following that process, it, it is now, but um, how many projects are still not on Verto and may still not be captured by um, this government's process that uh, we're now um, being assured will, will prevent these issues from happening in the future. So I don't think Verto question can be answered by SWAT, but I guess the scope, of, scope five, um, if you could just maybe um, outline sort of that a little bit in more detail, that would be great. And then section 151 on the vertical question. Or what's good. Thank you, Councillor Balderson. I'm happy to take that question. I, I, I just want to clarify I think what you're asking me is perhaps which of them were. Sorry. To be clear, are you asking me which? of the thematic findings were, were already there prior to the Blue School House work? Well, scope five, my understanding, was to review compliance in light of Blue School House, but this happened before Blue School House. So, um, so I was just trying to understand, um, was it scope five prim primarily to see where we found this? These, because Blue School House was all essentially we were, there was issues around the use of other budgets to cover the overspend. So we're sort of seeing similar things potentially in this, but <clears throat> was it just saying, well, we it found these issues in Blue School House and were they the same in prior year? Because this happened before Blue School Schoolhouse. So I was just trying to understand why, um, why that was such a large scope of the project if this had occurred before Blue School House. I wonder if what would be useful is to come back to committee with a bit of a breakdown as to perhaps what may already have been an issue because it was prior to Blue School House, but then perhaps what was what was additional. Does, does that make sense? If I could come back to committee and break that thematic findings down for you so that it's clear perhaps what would have been an issue before because we hadn't identifying the findings that we found in Blue School House and perhaps then what was sort of additional to that? Do, do, would that break down yeah. back to I think, I think the latter is probably more important to me because um, because this happened before Blue School House, but I can understand that there would have been similar issues on both projects. I guess what is more important to me is, well, what, what is different in terms of were there any other learnings that perhaps didn't come out of Blue School House that we needed to needed to address? Um, because it happened 
I would have expected the same issues on Blue School House, potentially on this one, because this occurred before Blue School before Blue School House. So if officers were operating in a particular way that led to the issues for Blue School House, then I could see that there would be similarities in this project. But it's what, were there any other issues that we did not pick up through the Blue School House review that really we should be um, focused on, I guess, is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I think um, Councillor Matthews. Yeah, if I could just... <coughs> follow on on Blue School House. Once again, myself and my colleague, Councillor Hardwick, we discussed that, we found, discovered that deficiency, not auditors, bless you. It is again us too with our research and, uh, uh, um, you know, deep involvement in it. We studied it, went through every report, and it was us that brought that deficiency into the public domain. So both these issues, as opposition, we raised them, and we pointed them out that they were serious issues. And it was only then after that that the internal auditors and that did their report. But it was the hard work of the then opposition. And I'm proud to say that myself and my colleagues on both of these occasions highlighted these deficiencies and these worries. And we should have really got a grip of things then. Thank you. Um, sorry, just section 151 on the Berto Capital. Yeah, yeah, so uh, we have a program management office that looks after all of our significant projects. So they look after all of the capital programs. So all the active projects and capital programs are on Verto. Uh, we have the insurance board all, the, all, all of them. them. So we monitor them to make sure that everything is doing what it should do. And if there are issues, they're escalated um, to the present place to make sure they're dealt with. And the PMO, we also roll with that out on for non capital projects, significant projects. So things are revenue funded. So we are applying the same rigor, same arrangements, and again reporting through third so, so that we can make sure we can keep a grip of what's going on at that granular level to enable us time I think is there and starting to go awry and we can escalate them to the person we don't look. How long has that procedure been in place? Uh, uh, well, in terms of Verto, that's been in place for a number of years. In terms of all of the capital program. Uh, that was last financial year, but they all came across, and we're now in the process of moving across uh, the non capital items onto the PMO. So there's a long term process to onboard all the new projects. And we just had the conversation about bidding for things. So as those <coughs> bids are being built up, they're being managed through the PMO process, and we're capturing the information at that very grand, uh, ground level. So it's down to land crews. So that will then just feed into we've got the bid in, we're successful, and we have to deliver. What timeline are you working towards to have all, all of the other revenue projects on Berto? Uh, I would need to check with the team, but I mean, certainly uh, with this financial year, I, I'm very happy maybe with some financial support work program to, to have a look at uh, maybe quarter three, quarter three, see how it progress. Okay, I think I have Councillor Gentleman and Councillor Summers and then Councillor Andrew. Thank you, let him come back again. Uh, I mean, the key here, as I say, is looking forwards learning from this and making sure that we have a what appears to be a period of time in which you will make the comment that blue school street this and i have a feeling that if we went in depth into uh the bypass or anything else we find that they're all being managed not shall we say to the level that any of us would have ever wished to see but it's making sure that in the future uh, that doesn't happen it seems important that this, for this committee, therefore, to have assurances and understand the mechanisms by which the points that are in these reports, which point out the weaknesses or the failings, how those are now being covered off. It's almost a, an item by item event that says, this has happened. Well, we haven't registered land, fine. How is that now being dealt with? We need to be able to say that these items are done. And I, I suspect that this is already in hand, but I think we need to have that assurance that the mechanisms are there. You've referred to a particular computer program that is used. Um, I don't know enough about it to know whether that's a good one, a bad one, its weaknesses, it's uh, uh, et cetera. But there's a great tendency in life to always break, blame computers when things go wrong. Um, rather than people who put the information in. So it's rather important that we actually have understanding that what it does and what it doesn't do, 
and would it, if it had been in place at that time, have solved all these problems? Or would it merely just be a tool that would have been used but disregarded? Because as we've seen in other reports, the failure to put information onto computers is one of the recurring themes that comes through SWAP. So um, I'd like to feel that this committee needs to have the sorts of assurances that the lessons in here are being learned and in depth looked at to make sure that the way they're being learned is in keeping with the requirements that we would all wish to see. And I guess I'd like to understand that in a little bit more detail because normally we would have all the actions and the recommendations and those recommendations would come back to us until uh, and we would see them until that they're completed. Many of them are listed as completed. So uh, what additional assurance would you perhaps like to see? I suppose what I'm saying is this report has come forward with a whole lot of recommendations. I want to be comfortable in knowing that the recommendations out of that uh, that are being audited and are being, uh, we can be comfortable that indeed those mistakes can't be made again, won't be made again, because the systems are in place to ensure that doesn't happen. I'm not sure that at the moment I'm sitting here comfortably, I'm looking at a report that tells me of all historically that went wrong. I want to know that if we started a project tomorrow, they're not going to happen because. Yeah. So I think so a lot of these are priority two findings um, and they've been marked as complete. So um, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Amy or Jackie, but that would for them to have been marked as complete and reported to us as complete, they would have had to have had to have audited something to ensure that it was complete and signed off. Um, so are you looking for us to try and put in a follow-up audit? To, to review other projects to ensure, yeah. so another follow-up audit. Um, I know, Amy, you put your hand up and perhaps section 151 for um, Walker can comment on that as well. So Amy first. Thank you, Councillor Alderson. Sorry, the dog, the dog has decided to be a bit vocal at that point, so just shutting the door. Um, yeah, just a couple of points from me. So in the 2021 uh, financial year, we did a capital programme audit, which looked at the very early implementation of the programme management office that um, Andrew Lovegrove mentioned earlier. And as part of that work, we suggested in that audit report that we come back and we have a look at those programme management office processes once they were embedded and had been sort of applied to the projects. I think that combined with this piece of work, the complete that you see in the um, management actions is the assessment by the officers that completed it. So my understanding is, and Jackie, correct me if I'm wrong, we would still come back as, and follow that up because it was um, their priority twos um, to, to almost provide that further level of assurance that they are complete as the um, management officers have, have said they are. Hopefully yeah, that can, I, can I just confirm so that means that you have in your pipeline an audit to come back and look at the, the, uh, the management office or project board and the process around capital projects? So we need to have those, that planning discussion with uh, Andrew and Ross, but certainly I see an audit coming back that will pick up the capital programme work we did to make sure that those processes embedded as well as picking up and capturing the actions that you've got today in the report. So perhaps that needs to be formed as a recommendation for today, so then it's captured and followed up. Thank you. That, that that's the direction of travel that I was trying to achieve, but much better put. Uh, do you have a point on that, yeah, on that comment? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just a bit concerned now that SWAP were marking their own homework. So if they've created the own, their own actions and they're saying that these actions are now signed off, who signs off their actions to say they're complete? So the internal audit have identified the issues yeah. together with management. Management have agreed what actions they're going to take to implement yeah. it. And then internal audit come back to ensure that they've implemented the actions that they've agreed to do. Okay, I still don't see how it's independent. Then the external auditor. And the external auditor is all just sign these off as well, is it? Currently? That would be a question for John and Robert. 
if he's still on loan? If I, if I yeah, start, we, that, that doesn't look like a three-eyed principle of watching stuff. So you've got somebody who's marked, marked the work and says, these are the actions I think you should do. The person who's created the work has said, yes, I agree with you. These are the actions I agree with. And then the original marker says, oh, great, you've done them. That's brilliant. So everybody is marking their own work. What should happen here? There should be an independent that says, actually, I agree with the action because I think that comes out of the report. I agree that the person has then resolved the action and I'm signing off the other two parties are correct. So you have three eyes checking that work. That doesn't read to me or sound to me that's taken place. That looks like the auditors audited. They've made their actions. They've talked, spoke to the auditee. They've agreed the actions. And then the auditor has marked the action saying they've been done, which is... But the auditor is the independent person. No, I, well, no, I, I disagree. That isn't completely independent. Shall I uh, leave to John Roberts and Jackie to respond? Yes, thank you. And, and um, you know, it, it's worth it's worth noting that, you know, swap, swap out whilst they are internal audit, they are still, a, you know, a, a, an external independent body from, from Herefordshire Council and, and have no incentive in terms of... Um, sort of fudging or soft peddling um they are sort of a, you know sort of assurances around whether a recommendation has been implemented or not um but what we would do we don't um review every individual recommendation that internal audit makes but what we do uh, consider is the council's overall response to risk and overall response to findings of internal audit so in these key areas such as this we would look for um signs of progress ourselves um and that internal audit was satisfied and that there was evidence that internal audit was satisfied now we wouldn't do that at the individual level but we would do that in a more sort of stand back um style of approach and, and obviously we are um independent we are the external auditors so the council can take um assurance from from that uh, level of um of scrutiny from from ourselves Thank you, John. And we also have Jackie, I think, that will like to respond. Yes, thank you, Councillor Um Just really um, to conclude with what John has said there, the internal auditors, your internal auditors, we are independent. Um, the process of following up on actions is that if it's a priority two or priority one, we actually revisit the action and we do perform tests to check the action has been implemented. Um, it's not an officer self-assessment, so we do actually go in and check the action has been actioned, the process is in place, and we can see that that process has been implemented. Um, that will then come back to you in our report um, as a follow-up. And as you will see in the report today that was presented to you, there are some actions that we've revisited that haven't been implemented, and therefore we have reported that back to you. Um, so yes, so our independence is there. Um, so you should be able to take some assurance from our follow-up work that we do. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Councillor Summers and then Councillor Bartlett. Thank you, Chair. So, been a lot of stuff happened in Hereford since 1956 when I first came here. Uh, we don't want to go back on all that stuff, but three things that well, have always bothered me, and that's uh, Newmarket Shopping Centre, um, the HCTTP, and Blue School. Now, the, the two previous ones started before at Blue School, um, been going on for quite a while before, and there's a lot of stuff going on. What bothers me more than that is call-ins, and I think you were right, Chair, with suggesting we need training on it. Uh, why was any, why was not any of this called in previously? Uh, a lot of people say things in council and everything else. I think this is my seventh year, but nobody ever calls anything in. Um, the rules attached to it, maybe we need to know more about it. Um, I think councillors, individuals need to have a little more say than, than we do. We, we get to vote and that's about it. But I think if we, if we think something's wrong, we should have some place to go to say so. And I think that's, that's missing. So I agree we need call-ins, definitely. We need training on that because it's available. It has been available forever. And the other thing is that individual councillors that are elected by their residents need to have a voice. And very few actually have a voice. And I think there needs to be something there in place that councillors can go to and make these suggestions. And that's just my spiel. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Summers. Councillor Bartlett. Yeah, thank you. And um, just following on from what Councillor Jimman was saying, actually, about assurance 
around uh, systems and Berto that we've got in place. So for me, this is this project. It was, um, you know, a sum of many parts, uh, not just the road. Yet it seems that the road part of the overall project has taken on much more of the budget and significance than it should have done. So it's in terms of that kind of reporting. I mean, we've, you know, going right back to 2017, we've got the um, Council of Price Cabinet member on the Worcester News uh, saying that there hadn't been an overspent on the road, um, although clearly there have been. Um, so my, what I, I, I want to understand, um, you know, when you then get, additional reporting in 2018. So previous leaders saying the road was on, on time and in budget. When we are going to manage these projects going forward and only one part of that package ever seems to be being reported back and then espoused in the public domain, are, are we sure that that's not going that that now has been nipped in the bud. You know, clearly we've got a business plan that should have had um, the figures for all parts of that project running concurrently, but don't seem to have been um, considered as a whole. Where one strand seems to have been given more precedence than the others, to the detriment of the others and to the detriment of um, commitments we had to external funders. Are we are we now assured that Berto will manage and we can manage the projects um, that have many strands running, that also have uh, money from other um, partners like the LEP that we can hold our head up and say we've spent we said what we wanted the money for. That's what we use the money for, and this is this is the output that we we were promised everybody with it. So those kind of um, misdirections about a project can't happen again. That we can be put in that situation again. So that's then my main projects about that uh, questions about that project. Um, I'd like an answer to. Uh, about the systems we've got in place. But then, then my additional question is about the compensation funds, because if we've got problems with partners um, and doing things properly, we have a whole piece in this report about the compensation uh, issues. Um, sorry, my mug just turned itself off. What is this happening to me today? Um, so we've got the compensation events, which seem to be taking their own course as well outside of the whole of the project strands. So do we have um, controls, checks and balances in place for that type of partnership work as well? So that overall, one of these large projects cannot go off, off the rails the way that this one did. So answers on that, would please. Shall I direct that to you, um, Andrew Lafferov, in the first instance? Or, or... Well, I don't want to come in, Chair. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm happy to sort of start the response, Chair. So, um, I mean, I think we, we've talked about this before, around the, the business cases coming forward and ensuring that the, the rigour is there, particularly around outline business cases. And we're going back to, I think, kind of Andrew's question around chasing the money and making sure that we can deliver on what we're we're getting money for so you know, whether it's from the left or any other grant um grant funding we need to make sure that we're very clear on what the business case is i think one example of it's slightly smaller scale but it shows how we now work differently particularly with the pmo setup that sits with andrew and then the designated sro uh, senior responsible officer being one of the directors for, for each of those projects the the recent report that went to cabinet around the climate change action plan was very clear in its delegations that none of those would proceed until the business case had been approved. And that takes us through that sort of rigor of the process that we need to make sure is in place that we won't just have a list of things that we think we will do and we will do them or not do them. 
it clearly says in that report and that delegation that the business cases are the starting point until they're in place we cannot proceed through that sort of the gatekeeper approach in effect that the, the PMO and the Berto process sets up for us so I think the, the rigour is there now to make sure that all these things are there before we even start any projects and before any funding is even bid for or received. And I have one further question in relation to the compensation events. I know um, it's addressed in finding six, which is on page 130 of our pack. Um, but there, there's also um, a, a section in that finding um, where it goes into a little bit more detail where the council must ensure that the original service orders include sufficient coverage, compensation events are raised correctly and approved, and compensation events against the same service order that are in excess of a percentage, in brackets to be agreed, of the original value of the service order should be scrutinized. Now they don't necessarily flow through to the action that has been agreed on that. So I had a question around that um, in terms of, and I, I appreciate ACOM reviewing the compensation events, but how are our contract procedure rules being updated to reflect these recommendations of random <coughs> compensation events to ensure that all of these actions that internal audit are coming up with are um, action and follow through on. So that might be you, and Mr. Lepreuve. Thank you, Chair. And in terms of the contract procedure rules and the financial procedure rules, they come through this committee on an annual basis to be reviewed. Uh, a lot of these transactions I've mentioned before were happening you know, five years ago, so we have very different contract procedure rules in place then. So um, we're building the recommendations of the report into the next iteration of contract procedure. Rules. So um, we'll make it very clear when that report comes to what changes have been made and reflects what we've got in. The compensation events are a key way of working with contractors. So I think that principle determines how we handle the compensation events, I think is the point of that. And um, there's no specific action um, in relation to this point where compensation events against the same service order that are in excess of a percentage to be agreed of the original value should be scrutinized and understand why the original service order is inadequate. So there's no specific element within the action um, for that. So does that mean that management didn't agree with that and that's not something that you're going to carry forward? Um, I don't think we disagree with it. I, I think the point is about what happens if you issue a service order or an amount, what happens if the consent event, consent event goes above that, how we deal with it, and that's the bit that we're picking up in contract procedure rules. So I think we've agreed it, it's just that's how we're going to deal with it. Okay. Um, Councillor Jimmy, yes. Just come back to a couple of sort of specifics within this. As I understand it, more land was purchased than was needed for the project. How did that, how is that accounted for now? In the sense that if there is more land there, presume the council now own that. Is that, is that a true statement? Do we own stuff beyond that which was required for the purposes of the project at the time? And in terms of the land in our ownership, that's a matter of fact, and that, that is, yeah, and I registered to have those details. And I think that's the, the substance of the, the recommendation we've got here. We don't have, at the moment, an exact record of which land was required as part of that initial budget. So I, we can't give you an exact answer because that's the point swap of rates. We don't have that level of clarity. And the, the other thing that I find slightly worrying is that Three leading councillors at the time have no recollection of being told anything. Um, there must be, you know, this implies that there was, at the time, there was no recording of decision making. And I mean, Swap are clearly concerned in what they've said that there are, seem to be some very important decisions made, but people have got blank memories as to it happening or might genuinely have never been told. We don't know. <coughs> I'm not casting aspersions here, I'm simply saying it's a statement in here that they have no memory of event. Well, there's some pretty important decisions measuring into millions of pounds, which people don't seem to have got anything recorded about. Now, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but does that go on Verto in future? 
I mean, how does decision making, how do we record it? How do we know that that's happened? How do we know somebody's been party to that decision? It, it yeah. might be proper, properly done, but I'm, it's, it's just a bit startling when you read it in that line. It, it is startling, you see it in that line. And I, I think one of the things that we've introduced recently in terms of you know, the cabinet member briefing structure, which is there for cabinet members and it's there for senior officers as well. It's something that Ross has introduced, he's making sure happens with all these projects. Do you want to say a little bit more about how that works? Just on the specific briefings and the- Yeah, and, and in terms of what's recorded. Yeah, so obviously the, the cabinet member briefings take place on a, on a monthly basis in a formal process. Um, so they're fully sort of agendaded and minuted to record everything that's there. Um, there will be informal conversations as, a, you know, as you'd expect, but there is a necessary need to, to ensure that anything that is a formal you know, recording of what was agreed or what was advised that, that goes through that process. And I believe Councillor uh, Harrington uh, has his hand up and may wish to come in on this point as well. Councillor Harrington. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, I, I wish to just ask a question at a later date, uh, a later point, actually, it, not, not relevant to this necessarily. Okay, we'll come back to you then. Um, uh, Councillor Dinman. Yeah, no, th thank you for that assurance. And I mean, it, it, this may well come back to Councillor training as well, in the sense that if Cabinet members know that the briefing is a briefing, but there's a minute, then the importance of reading that minute, because that's going to, to have your... Uh, agreement to it and that, that is going to be pretty fundamental here in terms of traceability of decision making. Yeah, and, and I think if I may um chairman you know page 212 and that summary from the you know the top line of the red no record of the land and costs have been identified support the land costs outlined in the business case and then the, the subsequent issues which flow around budget monitoring and control uh, around record keeping and tracking of decisions <laughs> and about contract management they just kind of they just tell the story of what you know how this project was managed during that time um, you know you talked before about the overlap with with blue school you know so what the audit shows is some of these practices were already ingrained into where people worked at the time mm. Um, and what we've got now from the introduction of the PMO, which came in January 2021, and the continual increase in compliance and scrutiny and governance arrangements is, is, is continually tightening up of those arrangements. And so as, as Andrew's outlined in terms of the PMO, um, all our capital programmes, now we move forward in terms of our revenue. You know, the issues around funding and grant opportunities all go through that same process. So we have a consistent and well-managed approach. And, and you might say, well, we would expect you to have, um, but that's the reality of, you know, for, for us, what good practices, that's what we're making sure is put in place. But I think the, of this report, page 212, is a very powerful summary. Absolutely. Now, I'm also just conscious that um, we've been sitting here for quite a while talking about this internal order report. So quick, can quick. I take Councillor Harrington's question and then one or two more questions and then um, from Andrew's and Matthew's and then we, we set to look back it up if possible. Um, Councillor Harrington. Sorry, Chair, I lost connection. I'll just reconnect it. I take it you're giving me the opportunity to ask a question yes. if that's all right. Yes, thank you. So, so I'd, I'd like to ask a broad question, really, of um, both council officers and also of the auditors. The, you know, when I came in as a cabinet member, um, I was given very scant detail on the Hereford City Centre Transport Package. I was, I was presented with a loose portfolio of about 12 designs and, and, and to told this was the, the sort of design that had gone forward so far on the Hereford Transport, uh, on the, the transport hub. Um, and, and, and was told a significant amount of money had been paid for that. I, I was concerned really about the process and I was concerned about who was in charge of delivering this because it didn't seem to me that there was anywhere near enough officer capacity on Herefordshire Council side to run this project. I was concerned it was being run by the department that was delivering it rather than from a, a central a project management uh, point, you know, point of contact. And I was also concerned that we appeared to have handed over almost all responsibility to Balfour Beatty to, to run this project. Am I, I, I'd like to sort of understand if I'm correct in 
understanding the process that essentially once we made a decision to use Balfour Beatty, we, we, we basically gave them all responsibility to run this project. And it doesn't seem that we had much view on what was happening uh, after that. In relation to SWAP, uh, quite frankly, I'd like to know what they were doing in all those years that they were looking at the issues related to this project. Because when we came in as a cabinet, we were asking questions that had been raised by members of the public and opposition members uh, and not getting answers, You know, not having original costs associated uh, with the land purchases, having land that was not in the original business plan, having an agreement with the LEPT, which didn't seem to fit in with what we were doing in terms of the, the money from the LEPT was required to be spent on active travel measures and sustainable transport and was being spent on a road. Who, who was checking this? Was Balfour supposed to be checking it? Was SWAP supposed to be checking it? Was SWAP, was SWAP getting any answers from officers or Balfour Beatty? And if they weren't getting them, and they, they weren't recording them, so they weren't getting them, what authority do they have to pursue um, to, to the required end those answers? And, and was it really just when we came in as administration that, that, that the sort of more significant reviews came? So in other words, was information not being given to the auditors? Did they feel that information was not being given to them? That's it, thank you. That's a large number of questions. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm not quite sure where we should start on that one. Um, perhaps if we go to swap initially and then perhaps um, Mr. Lovegrove um, in, the first, in the first and second instance. Thank you, Councillor Balderson. Um, I, th I think... Um, all I can sort of sort of add there is that we were we've been commissioned to do three pieces of work on the Hereford City Centre Transport Package. The first in 2016, um, which was around the financial accounting side of it, rather than the project itself, the project management and its governance. It was more around the financial accounting, and then, and I'm apologies because I probably get the exact date slightly wrong here. 2020, then at uh, the request of Andrew Lovegrove. Uh, the second piece of work, which we produced a briefing paper for, and now the piece of work that you see here. So we we wouldn't have been sort of checking or asking Balfour BT to be accountable. Um, we were only asked to do those three pieces of commissioned work. And I think we have identified a number of um, points coming out of this in terms of a follow-up review, perhaps further training on um, call-ins and you know, how we can perhaps um, use scrutiny in a, in a better way to perhaps try and address these things. Uh, but um, Mr. Lebro, do you have any other points to add? Thank you, Chair. I, I can't say handle that there's a, a large number of questions in, in that. Um, in terms of the getting under the skin of this project, it, it has been quite a, an uphill struggle. I think the aim is just explained from Sophie and uh, Councillor Matthews at the um, beginning of this conversation. Uh, over five years, we've been trying to get under the skin of this arrangement. I think we've now done that. Um, it's taken longer than we first thought, and I, I think maybe there have been other iterations of work that SWAP have done, either my request or request of the committee, uh, during those five, six years looking at this arrangement. So it has been uh, quite difficult to get to the detail. I think we've got there. In terms of the questions around um, the arrangements with Balfour BT, uh, you are correct that Balfour BT were commissioned to do a, a whole range of works. And have you seen the recommendations that we've now undertaken to, to review what they did, the delegated decision making they took around through the range of the road and the technical issues around their compensation events? So, so that was the arrangement in place um, when the work was commissioned to lay the tarmac, and that was what pre 2017, I think, tarmac related in 2016. So that's the arrangements we are looking at. Thank you. Um, Jim, Jim, I just follow up with one question. If you can make it succinct, please, Councillor. I will, I will make it succinct. So, so I just ask the auditors, what is your remit in a situation like this? Do you only respond to what you're being asked to look for, or do you look beyond that? Because quite frankly, it doesn't appear that you've looked beyond what you've been asked to do. If that's your remit, understood, but it's unsatisfactory if that is the remit. Is that internal audit or external audit, Councillor Harrington? I might as well chuck them both then. Um, so internal audit first? Thank you, Councillor Harrington. Um, we're obviously commissioned to do pieces of work. We'll work with officers to um, develop that scope. 
but I think it's fair to say if we felt there was a significant risk or we um, identified something or found evidence to suggest there was bigger risks or other risks that were outside of the scope, they would be raised with officers, um, you know, to look at those further. We wouldn't just we wouldn't ignore anything just because it wasn't in our scope. Um, but as I explained to you, that first initial piece of work we did was very much around the financial accounting. And I believe from the findings from that work, there were no, there was no evidence to suggest there were any other concerns at that point. And that's the balance, isn't it, between internal audit assurance, scrutiny, um, member calling, you know, all those different elements. But uh, John Roberts, would you like to respond as well? Okay, and and so this is going back to June last year now, June 21, which is our statutory audit report, our statutory auditors uh, findings report considered by the um, audit committee. So we talk around the council's arrangements for um, managing the contract and uh, commissioning further work and problems with the uh, lack of controls around that and at the end of that document and this is the the important point for, for the cabinet members uh, reference really uh, we brought bring the very clear conclusion which is our qualified um, opinion in light of the concerns raised over the Balfour Beatty living places contract and the findings identified from the internal investigations we have concluded the council does not have appropriate arrangements in place over its capital program our VFF conclusion will therefore be qualified with that respect so the qualification means we are saying the council has inadequate arrangements over, over this particular area so that was a statutory audit finding from last june so in terms of of what we say and how then the sort of the actions that flow from that uh, statement that's i think the um, I think the, the question for, from the cabinet member is, is what happens to an audit finding of that nature, because that is our, our remit governed by the Local Audit and Accountability Act is to form an opinion, and we formed a qualified opinion. So it's how that is then taken forward uh, by the organisation that's, that's really important. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Now, I, I know time, we do really need to start thinking about wrapping this up. So I think we have Councillor Matthews, Councillor Andrews and Councillor Summers, and that will be it. And if we could keep it as succinct as possible, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Roberts, seeing you're, oh, you're disappeared, if you could come back with us for a second. <clears throat> Can you tell us that either Mr. Jones or you, when you took over, the fact that you were made aware of some of the things that went sadly wrong at the stage that they were brought to your attention, surely you, should, as external auditors, you should have made it abundantly clear in a report or in some sort of comment to the administration that they had to get a real sound grip of this contract because of the issues that have been raised. Was that done? And if not, why not? Yes, it was. Yeah, it was done through a succession of audit reports and, and we can share the the paper trail with 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 you if if um, if you'd like um you know going back to um our reporting responsibilities around the, the value for money audit and risk assessment and so on and, and a lot of the assurances we get year on year are then around how the council is responding so so the council's response would be we need further work and it's right into an audit then does the detailed review of that further work um to identify you know that the whether the um arrangements are improving or not so it builds year on year so when we first identified it we were reporting um that we were monitoring the outcome of the blue school uh, uh issue and internal audit was subsequently doing pieces of work around that and making recommendations clearly auditors can only make recommendations they can't implement them so so that's uh, important that we were then seeing that were recommendations being made and implemented in some cases they were in some cases they weren't this matter as i said uh, earlier this matter of capital governance since you raised it first has been a feature of all the external audits and you can trace um, our commentary around that now that culminated when i say it builds 
as external auditors, we, we don't just just sort of shoot from the hip. We, we build our uh, build our findings that built to the qualified value for money report from last year, where we said the council's specific arrangements around that area were inadequate when we said that clearly. Um, and then this year, where we are saying that further to the qualification last year, um, that we are still saying that there is a significant weakness in the arrangements there. The uh, reporting definitions have changed slightly, but it, but it's still, still quite a finding. Um, where we go from here as external auditors, and I don't believe this is appropriate um, in Herefordshire's case, but the only other place that an external auditor has to go from a qualified opinion or a significant weakness is to something called a report in the public interest. Now we're not in that territory, but, but that just shows you where, where we are sort of positioned in terms of our um, array of statutory powers. But, but it's absolutely been, been a feature of our audit and reported uh, to this committee over the years. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. I'm quite concerned to you, you say what you've just said. But if you were I like in the concerns that they weren't properly addressed. Anyway, thank you for that. But I agree with my colleague here, Councillor Jim, and you know, we've got to deal with this, sort it out and move on. And uh, and and uh, that's where we are. But thank you. Councillor Andrews. I'm going to get to you from Councillor Matthews there, I think we're good. I'm, I'm also going to say, I think we're being very polite around the table about this report that actually doesn't escalate to the level it really should do. So in the public interest, overspending something by nearly 20 million pounds, I think it's significant that the public should know. So by saying, you know, it shouldn't be escalated, I don't completely agree with that. Within it, I was quite surprised there's only one priority one in that, and a lot of priority twos. I would expect a lot more of those priority twos to be priority ones. In, in the depth of this sort of this era of a project is, is surmounted to being so grossly over budget, spend so much people's time debating it and over two administrations now that you've got to this level. We have a basis of three, I would say, significantly experienced councillors saying in a report of two different scope investigations that they weren't aware of these events taking place, which I find really surprising. However, I'll give them the elements of the day the fact that perhaps they weren't told. But I would have thought within their experience they would have known to ask. So I think that's a massive gap within there. And that's something I think when the future project management governance you're going to have, is how why you say you're going to give communications, how can we be assured that, that communication is going to be full and in place for everything that's going to be said, so it isn't missing a key item out because it works maybe in the council officer's favour not to say those things, and they should be put there. And how does a councillor know when he's not being told something? And I think that's a massive gap within it and something that, again, maybe I'm a little bit agitated by it, but I think we're being too polite. We should expect more from our officers doing it in the, in the paid positions. And I think the county expects a better outcome for this project and this investigation for it. So I don't completely agree with the independent assessment. I think that you are marking your own homework a little bit, even though you're saying you're not. I don't, I don't agree with it. Well, I am surprised that there's not more action and sort of frustration being tabled out of this. It's been me um, I think quite rightly members have raised a number of concerns about how the project has been managed over time um, and the weaknesses which have been identified in what I think is a very powerful summary on page 212. Um, and, and John has articulated you know that these issues have been brought to, to, to the committee in terms of how projects have been managed in previous audit reports and as he described it's been building for some time and um, i think to be fair when 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 i joined the organization and this was brought to my attention we moved very quickly uh, in terms of wanting to understand what had happened here so with the support of the cabinet members you know within three months there was a report at Cabinet in July, which laid bare the issues that have been found. Um, and those have been, first of all, I think, to be fair to Andrew, and he'd identified some of the financial issues and the management of the budget issues early in 2021. Um, and that those were brought to my attention by Andrew and by Cabinet members. And within a few months, the item was in the public domain at Cabinet in July. What's followed since has been an in-depth investigation and, and laid bare what, how this project has been managed since 2015, if not before in many respects, 
these things just haven't happened yesterday. They've been happening for some time. Um, and the organisation has, has been managing within that in many respects. Grant Thornton and John have been bringing the matters to their attention. You know, it's for others to decide whether, you know, they feel they should have been you know, broader and deeper in terms of that analysis. But, you know, I think from what John's saying, that had, some of these things have been brought to the organisation's attention previously. We've got it now laid bare. I don't think it could have been laid bare any simpler in terms of the failures. Um, you know, there's always an issue about language, but it's, it's pretty frank in terms of what's happened here or what's not, not happened here. Um, and equally, I think it's pretty frank that the auditors have said, you know, since 2021, there's been a change in the organisation in how it manages projects. I fully understand the assurance you are looking for in terms of how the capital programme and major revenue projects are delivered. And I think there's an opportunity to do that through the reporting arrangements that Andrew can talk about and you can have that assurance. I think this is about members having an inquiry mind um, and only by members having an inquiry mind did this issue surface in early 2021. Um, and I think then with the officers who were at play to take this, to bring this item forward and make sure it is investigated. This isn't a good read for the organisation, but it's what's actually happened. So we have to you know, face up to it and deal with it. And the organisation has been mature enough to do this piece of work and have it done. It's now you know, acting on the recommendations, putting the assurance in place and delivering these projects with confidence um, and being clear about when, when, it's good news, when it's good news, tell people. When it's not good news, you still tell people because that's part of how we work as an organisation. And I, I'll stop there because we're all passionate about this one. But, uh, Thank you. And Councillor Summers, if you'd like to finish up, please. Yeah, very quickly, Chair, thank you. Simply put, uh, I put to Paul, Paul um, are there, is there any potential for legal investigation here? With, with regard to which, Alan, we have, we've got a piece of work. There's to 20 million with, pounds missing, basically. We've got a piece of work to finish off with uh, ACOM. And we're doing a verification of um, of the of the financial elements of this particular scheme and the compensation payments that's a that's a piece of work we have to finish off mm -hmm. and see where see where that takes us and that, I, I think to be fair it's not a good comment beyond that at this stage so the non the no comment it's not a no comment there's a piece of work to be concluded as to where can we it, expect to see that piece of work concluded because there's people waiting with bated breath out there the residents who want to know where their 20 million has gone and they'd like to know who's taken it, basically. And I'm not saying anybody's taken it, but it's missing, so. I'm not know. quite sure about the, the 20 million's gone missing. I think there's been an overspend on the project, well, overspend, which, hasn't, yeah, which but, hasn't been reported. But to, um, what we're doing is now verifying the costs which have been incurred um, and the compensatory payments that have been made. <coughs> we'll take a view of that once we get facts of that piece of work. Yeah, that was my error. I shouldn't have said gone missing. It's no, no, that's right. there's money being spent supposedly on properties yeah. etc that we don't have records of yeah that's a concern i fully accept that and it's my concern too and that's why we are getting the so evidence that's the legal part I yeah mean. the evidence that we need to be able to make a case if a case needs to be made thank you okay great chair, well, chair if i could very briefly i'd like to withdraw that remark that i made about moving on it's far too serious to move on we've got to get the matter resolved and looked at in every respect uh, I'd like to think that we've done sufficient, that we were at a clear conscience to move on, but we're not in that position. Could I ask Councillor Harrington, are you with us, Councillor Harrington? Yes, he's there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> could you tell me when you first became aware, because you came in in 2019, when you first became aware that you were told the true facts, that there was something not quite right? When I faced... I'm not sure I was ever quite told until I pushed. Within about uh, six months, I uh, I realised there was a serious issue. I was told after about six months when I inquired that the CPOs had not yet been fully uh, completed. I asked a question uh, around the LEP funding. I asked if the LEP was aware that we had used money that was supposedly been for sustainable transport uh, initiatives on road purchases. If it was if if they understood that money that was supposed to have been defrayed by whenever it was, March 2018, 
had actually been used on the road. I then spoke to, Count, well, when we first came as administration, Councillor Davies and Councillor Harvey and I had conversations with uh, Mr Lovegrove about the management of this project. It was very unclear who was managing it, where the records were being kept. Mr Lovegrove initiated an initial report. We then initi initiated another report. And in March of, uh, sorry, in January of 2021, we had the final report, which, which had specific questions to be asked. So the, the issue here is precisely um, the pertinent issue. And actually, I, I think I need to put this on record because it was not, it was not January 2021 when we started asking questions at administration. We started asking questions almost immediately. And partly because of the work that people like yourself in opposition and Councillor Powers and Harvey in opposition had done, and partly because of the questions that remain answered, unanswered, that members of the public had asked repeatedly without uh, any response. Uh, and and that, that is why I'm surprised at, and, and, and to be fair, John from, from Grant Thornton has given me an understanding that really they are not they are not it's not in their remits to keep asking questions within an investigation they they ask a question and they present their their response or their findings but yeah it is it's an extraordinary way to handle projects and our record keeping and our process w was quite frankly baffling to me but we are getting there Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harrington. On that note, I think we need to circle back to the recommendations on this um, agenda item, please. So that, that A, the performance against approval plan be reviewed and any areas for improvement identified. B, the insurances and recommendations given in the report are reviewed and appropriate recommendations are provided to the executive on areas for priority implementation. To note the corporate fraud update and to note the Hereford Centre transport package, city centre transport package special investigation summary report. So I just looked to the clerk now, um, if you could please summarise um, any actions or recommendations that you have noted from our quite lengthy discussions this morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've um, made a number, made a number of notes um, in terms of recommendations and, and potential um, actions as well. Um, you may think that some that are along one area or another, but if I just, in terms of recommendations, an early one potentially was that the um, Section 1 Club Officer um, uh, it be recommended uh, that uh, the set the safe wide transport package let settlement audit to also brings together the findings from earlier audits on this matter. Um, yes, we needed to recircle on that one. Um, did you want to have further input into the scoping of that? Um, maybe as an action item uh, that in internal audit come to us on the, on the scoping of that project before it, but that's not normally how, um, how it works. Andrew Lovell, mm -hmm. would you like to comment on that? Well, I, I think, Chair, um, we've heard your comments about wanting to be clear about the scoping of that work. And I think, as Amy and uh, said, there is other work that has been done. So I think we need to go and reflect on what work has been done. And I'm happy to have a conversation with Council Chairman uh, in the meantime to make sure that we've covered everything he has in mind. We have to look at the scoping. We have all make sure that's shared. And I think one thing we have requested is that we have, do have a summary scope in um, the pipeline of audits. So we should be able to see the pipeline of audits coming through with the scope and then we can challenge perhaps the scope at that point. Okay, so I, I think that I think that will be covered by by um, other actions. So, so let's identify that as an action um, to, to, to look at the, the scope when it comes back as part of the, the pipeline. I do, I, do we actually need to record it as an action? I think we just pick it up through our review of the pipeline document when it comes through. Thank you. Um, the, uh, another matter that you raised was um, regarding, um, in view of the ongoing work on grant certification, um, about recommending that for consideration given to commission additional audit work. Oh, I think that was looking at the budget, um, the comment that uh, Mr. Ludbrook made that whether we are in a position to increase our budget next year to do more audit work if we some of our grants. Funding money. I don't think we're in a position to extend the budget because that, that's part of the public side. But the question I think was was there any money that could be carried over from the year that's just finished? 
the new burdens grants we like to get to fund for additional uh, audit work here, the current year. So I'm happy to go away and have a conversation. We're we'll just in the process of closing down. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
and you say it's not quite big enough, so we won't fill it in today. It, it's how we capture the importance of being clear what SWOT are and what they're not auditing. And I think there's a lesson in there somewhere, which I'm not terribly sure how we do that, but I simply ask it to take the way looked at, thought of in terms of the education and the clarity for which we describe what an audit is doing so that we don't have the what old scenario I've just mentioned, because it's clear that things are falling between particular specific audits. And I think this is where, I mean, internal audit will have their risk universe and their in, entire um, universe of which they um, could look at. And from a risk perspective, they then narrow down the areas that they think they should look at together with officers. Um, and I think this is where the pipeline for us will become very important because at the moment we're only seeing what they're actually doing now. We're not seeing what they're doing covering across the entire year. So, um, so I think once we start seeing that pipeline come through with our quarterly plan, we will then get a much better understanding of um, the, the universe that they're looking at and it's not specific just um, what the officers are asking them to look at. But they they have, and they have a responsibility to, as an independent party, to to make their decisions and and, and do the audits that they feel that need to be done as well. I think that's right, Chairman. If I may, and I think you got to place this as a special piece of work that was done, yes. and, and it was part of the recommendations that went to cabinet in July twenty twenty one. You know that the chief executive commissioned this particular piece of audit work to understand what had gone wrong, what the failures had been, and, and also at the same time understand, you know, the expenditure which had been incurred, and then from that how this particular project will be funded to completion, and that's the second part of this. So I think there always will be those special pieces of work because things happen, um, and, and it's about making sure that the scope of those special pieces of work you know, pick up and answer the questions that we want answered. And this is my concern about getting the balance right um, in ensuring that we're still covering all the other areas that in general that need to do is from a bread and butter perspective. So sorry, Ben, do we have any other action? Um, only if you want to look at the key findings um, in relation to the school house recirculating to all members, as Mr. Jim suggests. Um, but I don't have any others on my list. Yep. Everyone in agreement with that. Any other actions or recommendations that you would like to make? So if I can see a show of hands to um, on the recommendations, Audrey. Great, thank you. I suggest we take a break. Um, 10 minutes, uh, and that will allow Council Shaw to uh, come back into the room as well. It is currently 1.25, so 1.35. Uh, I just got my apologies for the briefing at two o'clock. Um, ben, I'm not quite sure if you're able on, on the And consider the management responses. Uh, John, if you want to uh, 
So a few words to judicial report. And draw attention to any uh, any areas that uh, you think are will be beneficial. Thank you, Chair. And um, as, as the report has been in circulation with members probably longer than we would normally have, I think we, we, we can sort of take it, uh, take it as read um, as well, which, which is helpful. So when we introduced the audit plan for the year, I explained to members that the value for money work that auditors do had changed under the code of audit practice. Um, the new code gave auditors a greater remit to report more broadly than previously. Uh, in previous years, we would have reported by exception. Now we are required to provide you with a narrative report that covers all of the um, areas of the code of audit practice, uh, and those that were being defined as improving economy efficiency and effectiveness. So the performance of the council's arrangements, the governance arrangements and financial sustainability. So at the time we talked to the committee about the plan, uh, Councillor Harvey was in attendance and she, she did make the point rightly. So I think to say that previous uh, value for money audits hadn't actually given the council um, a great deal of um, detail. This um, new style of report, I would hope you would agree, does give you uh, more things. I, I certainly welcome it as your auditor, welcome the ability that it gives me to sort of um, tell the audit story of the council uh, more effectively than the previous version of the code. But uh, one thing that, that members will note is that this is the um, value for money audit report for the 2021 financial year. So it's dated 11th of April 22 when we finalised it. So a whole year after the year that it related to. And there's been a lot of progress since then. Now, part, part of the report, and it is later than we would have um, otherwise have liked, um, it's been caught up in what is a national issue in terms of uh, the delivery of local authority audits, but, but it's still important that uh, what you get and what you consider is timely and is um, up to date. Now, because it's our uh, statutory report on 2021, that has to be the year that we anchor our findings in. Um, but what we do try to do within this report is reflect on uh, progress that the Council has been making. And there is a, is a good list on page 130 of your pack is a good list of the, uh, the various initiatives um, that have been um, put in place over the last year. Now, we credit that and we recognize that in this report but we haven't audited it yet so so we can't actually sort of give give members formal assurance on those things but we will be coming uh, to do that over the next over the next audit and we will be reporting our next auditor's annual report this calendar year so so that's our intention anyway with a with a smooth run so so that will be will be earlier than you're uh, getting it at this stage one thing I think that is helpful as well for members, when you actually look at um, management's response to our recommendations, you can see that the actions uh, that the council is committing to, to follow through are, are still relevant and, and new. So that's not saying that the recommendations are old and superseded. That's saying that you know, we, we've pitched them in a way that is, is still current and, and relevant to the, uh, to the work of the council. But inevitably, a lot of things uh, will be work in progress. Under the new code of practice, we report our recommendations using three levels of importance and significance. One is statutory. So that's the sort of the public interest style recommendations I referred to earlier on. Uh, and pleased to say there are no statutory recommendations that we are reporting in this document. The next tier of reporting is key recommendations against significant VFM weaknesses. Now, these are still important recommendations, and we make three of those. And that's probably... Um, in terms of what most councils get, that I would say that is is as much as most councils get. Some get some some exceptions will get more. The majority will get less. However, the nature of the key recommendations that I will go on to describe to you are somewhat historic as well. So so this is this is uh, partly us sort of bringing up to date the legacy situation in certain areas. Uh, and then we make 14 improvement recommendations. Now, these are um, 
designed to draw upon best practice. They are designed to add value. And as you'll see, the councils responded positively to these improvement recommendations. And, and, I, and I believe that, that in these areas, this is the sort of the challenge that Councillor Harvey gave us, is to come up with recommendations that the council can take forward and, and get value from. So, so that's where we are on that. If I can, I'm not going to turn all the pages in this document. As I say, we'll, we'll take it as read, but I do want to emphasize the um, list of developments on page 131. I think that's important uh, context. And then if I can take you to page 132, I'll talk you through the um, key recommendations and why we make them. The first two won't be... Um, new to the committee. One relates to the so, uh, children's social care and the council's ongoing response uh, to the matters raised last year, uh, where you're at in terms of legal judgments, where you're at in terms of the offset inspection um, that followed and um, the improvement actions uh, that the council is taking. So really important area, really important area for attention for the council. Under the NAO code, we are required to take into account the work and findings of other regulators and other bodies um, and report on it accordingly um, with our uh, responsibilities as well. So that's what we've done on the children's social care area. It was also subject to uh, qualification last year. So we will, we will continue to uh, monitor progress in this uh, key area for the council, and we'll continue to sort of grade any recommendations that we might be making on that based on uh, where the council's response uh, takes it. Um, the second point is, uh, is another example of legacy issues that are carrying forward, and that's the um, public realm and facilities management contract that we've just debated. Um, so I, I won't add any, any more to that, really, because I, I, I gave the sort of the, the update that I would give to members um, in, the, um, in the previous agenda items. So, so that, that, again, is a sign of something that we will follow through. I think it's important, even though we are saying, yes, the council is uh, making good progress. Yes, the council is changing. Um, this council is making improvements. Movements, it's still important, and, and this is a very really good example of that, not to be uh, complacent about some of the issues from the past to make sure that they are um, properly um, bedded in and addressed uh, going forward. Now, the third um, key recommendation is new to the committee, uh, and this relates to uh, the council's contracting um, with... Um, Balfour Beatty and Balfour Beatty Living Places, uh, which we found that the Balfour Beatty Living Places was a uh, dormant company um, in terms of the, the records at company's house. Now, we're not Balfour Beatty's auditors, we're not BBLP's auditors. So, what we report is um, through our um, lens of the council's auditor. We're not criticizing or endorsing uh, the work of the company um, in this point, but we can tell members that the company was transparent with the council in terms of how it constructed um, its side of the tender when it contracted with you several years ago. What we do feel, though, that from the council's perspective, and as has been um, demonstrated through the, the legal advice that you've recently taken, uh, was that the council itself didn't actually then construct its contractual arrangements in such a way that reflected how BBLP and Balfour Beatty were actually presenting its side of the uh, arrangements to the council. So there are arrangements within the construction of the contract itself. Um, and there are also some, some wider issues uh, regarding that that, uh, that need to be ad addressed. And that's why we've, we've got it as a key recommendation. Um, there's not a massive amount more I can say about that without straying into sort of legal, legal territory and, and, and some of the background to that legal advice. So um, I'd probably safer to, to leave it there for the committee. However, on the other code um, areas, which are set out on page 133, um, we talk about the improvement uh, recommendations that we've made. So five relating to arrangements for improving the three E's, uh, two improvement recommendations relating to governance, and seven relating to financial uh, sustainability. Um, we draw upon 
our knowledge of best practice, we draw upon our expectations um, of what the council's arrangements should be, and we use benchmarking to inform those arrangements, as as you will see uh, through the uh, through the report itself. So, I wasn't intending to draw out any more detail at this point, Chair, rather than to be available to answer questions. I do have with me the report's um, author, our Value for Money specialist, Jeanette Beal. She's on the call. Jeanette, if you'd put your camera on, please. And I'm not sure if Gail, Gail is also on the call. Gail's our audit manager. Um, so she she's there too, and, and she has background to the audit, and Jeanette and Gail can help with any uh, answering of any questions. Also on the call, and for the committee's uh, reference, I've got Peter Barber, who Peter will be replacing me as engagement leader, and we'll introduce him to the committee uh, in due course. But we felt he was um, this was an important meeting, so it would be a good part of the uh, the handover for me to Peter. Um, I've come to the end of my tenure as the council's auditor. We can only do so many years, so so Peter's a natural uh, replacement. But um, all those introductions in due course. But just wanted to make you comfortable that um, that. Of, of who was on the call from Grant Thornton. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, John. Um, before I go to the committee, uh, there's a couple of questions I've got in my mind um, I'd like to raise, um, and, uh, and then we'll jump to committee. Um, firstly, dealing with the third um, uh, significant uh, 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 recommendation concerning this storm and company. Um, I'm, I'm not sure when the contract was actually made. Uh, uh, was it was it would have been a significant contract when it was made when it was made because it's over a, a good number of years. Who was the, the um, who was the auditor at the time? Do you know? The external. I auditor. would imagine that would be the audit commission, would it? Back in back in the day, when when was the? I will be back in that in that time. Mm, might be that far back. Right, thank you. And um, the improvement recommendation eight. Um, you talk about the MTFS medium term financial strategy should be three or five years. Um, I don't know whether you know um, of sort of similar authorities uh, to ourselves that actually employ five years. In, when you come across those, you. Um, in your role, um, and I just wondered if you wanted to, could give us some advice or comment on the difficulty of creating a five-year MTFS mm. uh, when we only have a one-year financial settlement. I, th I think you know. I think five years is is clearly sort of the, the further you go into the future, the the less um, the less precise you can be. But uh, with these things, it's important that they roll. So, so each year you, you roll roll a year forward and, and you re reflect and you update the you know the, the subsequent years into that period but but three years is is the common common period for a medium term uh, financial strategy I think the you know the idea is it's, it's medium term um, it's it's the recommended um, practice really is to take you know current year where you've got the the level of detail second year is is, is expected and third year is is there's this less of a clear expectation but at least that ability to roll forward and update it thank you and, and that's presumably a sit for Based recommendation. That's been it? that's been established practice for, for, for as long as I, I know medium term financial strategies. I'm I'm pretty sure it's it's if yeah. we we could certainly look look up the uh, look up the origin of it. Yeah. I suspect I suspect you're right, Chair. Okay, thank you. Do you have questions on the external audit report? Okay, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, John and uh, for this your final final report in the session. Um, yeah, I, I, let's go back to these um, three recommendations, key recommendations, if we may. I mean, the children's social service, uh, social care services issue. When did Grant Thornton first appreciate there was a problem? Mm, I think the you know the the extent of the problem as as we reflected it in last year's audit was um was through the um the the court judgment um 
so that would be the the extent really that you know the full nature of the problem and you know we we go back to you know what the Ofsted ratings were at the time etc um so were there such clear alarm bells ringing before that time um not 100% 100% clear, but there were certainly certainly issues. You know, there were certainly um, children's social care issues. Again, those had been reflected in discussions at the audit committee, and you know, our knowledge of those were um, were through those discussions and papers that had been prepared uh, for audit committee at the time. But I think the committee uh, and ourselves uh, were more at that point reassured that the action was being taken to address the the older findings so that when the um the court judgment from last year came through it was more of a um and it wasn't wasn't in line with expectations the, and certainly this the um severity of of the issue and the the judgment wasn't uh, wasn't anticipated now i think it's fair to say that the judgments, of course, were quite based around historic cases going back many Mm. years. Um, And that sort of raises a question as to internal audit, as to why that was not picked up and flagged in a greater way, which one would assume would then be picked up by yourself. So if the one doesn't pick it up, why doesn't Mm. How, how this interaction between the two? I, th- I think the, as I say, there, there was an, an issue a number of years ago, but I think both, uh, speak for internal audit, but both internal and external audit would have been reassured, as was the committee, as was the committee at that time, that um, that the response was was appropriate and was being, um, and, and the matter would be then dealt with. What need to be careful of, though, in terms of, responsibility for the quality of social care practice which is which is what we're talking about you know this is a highly sort of specialized area and it is regulated um by by um the care quality commission and and by you know specific uh regulators offset and and so on so it's important that the the regulators work is what auditors would draw upon in terms of the quality of of care arrangements in place I suppose the point that comes from this, again, looking forwards, is how do we ensure that the processes are indeed fit for purpose going forward? Mm. And when and how do you ensure that you can say, having looked at this, it's no longer on our radar because we see it as now uh, meeting the requirements? Yeah, this this is one, as I said in, in my introduction, this is one area because it's an area of professional practice. And, you know, clearly we're not we're not social uh, work experts in Grant Thornton, but the, the right regulators are, are experts and, and bring bring that to bear. So that's what we would principally um, take as as the sort of the signs that improvement was in place is what the um, appropriate regulators were saying about performance. Thank you. Um, quite happy to go on with the next question, but it might be sensible to let somebody else in. Councillor Andrews? Yes, yeah. Councillor Andrews. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, I'm, I'm not going to have a go at you this time, to be honest. You'll be glad to know. So, <laughs> <It's> whilst, <laughs> so whilst you had your, um, your report, which is fantastic, you've made your recommendations, I think the bit I'm, I'm after now from our, our council colleagues is knowing when this report comes back into you, how does it then get transpired into actions or review through the cabinet and the officers to say, actually, we're going to agree with this report or not agree with it? And how do we track those actions to make sure they either are confirmed as we're not going to do it, or we recognise it, we're going to do it, or we're definitely going to do it? So where, where does that capture itself in? Because otherwise, again, looking for value of money, I would say you've wasted your money because if you get some new commission report, you get it, you get recommendations, and you ignore it. Just don't ask for the report. Uh, one flag, one officer. Did you want to? Uh, I'll, 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 I'll go uh, respond to that. So, in terms of the um, the report, as John said, his team is part of that staffing process, and, and we receive a, a draft from them with the, with the points they're making. And you can see we put the management responses from the officer side 
to that, and we've been through a process to agree that. So I think that uh, if officers didn't agree, that would be either re resolve that with John or when it comes to this meeting, there will be a few on that line. They say, well, we've agreed on that. Do uh, agree with uh, the auditors. That then forms part of the corporate leadership team's work program to look at those arrangements. So that's the meeting with senior officers. And that, that work then is allocated across various bits of, of the council to do all those things. So in terms of value for money of, of about the BT contract arrangements, for example, there is a board a cabinet, there is a process to oversee those improvements, the improvement board, and then it's put onto the, to the website. So those things are in fact three in there. In terms of checking that we've done or what, what we responses are, are they delivered? That is part of what uh, Grant wants to do next time round. So they will come back and they will dust off this list, make sure that we've done the things we've said. And if we haven't, they will be reporting to you through this committee. Okay. Um, I've, I've just been flagged that we are at the expiry of three hours uh, for the meeting. So I need to determine whether we continue beyond the three hours duration. Well, you're just warming up. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I suggest that uh, given the number of, although we've got a number of agenda items, um, that we might try and uh, aim for a 2.30 uh, completion. Give us 30 minutes to, to yeah, get through. Yeah, that's um, <coughs> if, if, we're, uh, if we're struggling, we might have to uh, uh, improve in, in extend the meeting still further. I've got a question. Sorry, yes. And Councillor Bartlett raised a hand. Sorry, Sorry. Councillor Bartlett. Thank you. Um, yes, and we are ticking on and in time. I, did, I just wanted to ask, while well, we still had John here, and I know he needs to go too. Um, I, I will stay till 2.30. I'm just making arrangements as, as we talk now to, to, to stay. Oh, thank you, John. That's lovely, yes. especially as this seems to be the last time we might mm. see you anyway. Um, so, so I'm just looking at this report and listening to what you just said. So we've got a report which is a historical report about 2021, written on a new template going forward to report in a narrative style on value for money. So that narrative has been written with the, um, the position the council is in now. So it's almost like you're writing a historical report with hindsight, uh, which is, Interesting, and I'm, I'm sure as it's the first one, I'm sure will uh, everything will, will work a lot more smoothly when timescales have caught up on value for money going forward with the annual reports. So, and I, and I guess that, yes, it, it's about, so you've got our narrative of where we are now, um, but it would, I think it's been brought up before, it would have been interesting to have your narrative in the report about what you had said before about these issues rather than than just our side of it uh, but that said it's not there we've just got what we've got in front of us um, so things like the BBLP if that was if that was already known what was the story behind that so moving on from the three key ones the one that I'm interested in on pages 144 and 149 are about the strategic partnerships, um, which is, I think, uh, for me, is really important. I know Councillor Watson has brought this up several times at uh, audit before. Um, we have a, a good narrative about where we are with our um strategic partnerships and as they certainly came up to uh, to the committee I think it was September 2019 as, as quite a large item um, and then we've got on page 149 we've got uh, your um, recommendations so uh, you've got a recommendation here about defining why the partnership is a significant partnership in line with the council's own definition. 
And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about um, the significance of that, because looking at the management comment, we've got, um, we're just going to revisit the guidelines, et cetera, rather than the value that those partnerships bring or don't bring, considering that there's large values of money. So, so basically, John, really, do you think, do you, do you think, the management comment reflects your recommendation. And also I'd quite like to ask one, the officer responsible for the significant partnerships, whether we should be, shouldn't be doing a little bit more to ensure that our significant partnerships are significant and adding mm. value. Thank you. Okay, thanks. If I could bring Jeanette in to, to talk to this one as, as the person with, with the detail behind it, but broadly, it, it stacked up to me, the management comment broadly stacked up, but, but Jeanette, if you could take this one, please. Yeah, th thank you, John. Um, I, th I think it does, I mean, because what, what our recommendation does is focuses around the self-assessment. So within the self-assessment, there are questions around the value as in um, funding that's put, put into the significant um, partnerships. There's a number of things. Uh, I think, you know, as a, as a council, you can be um, commended for some of the things you have done around your partnerships. And I'm, you know, the recommendation is about, you know, taking it to the next level and going, OK, so you've begun this process, you've got these self-assessments. How can we really ensure that these self-assessments are not just playing lip service to the arrangements but really adding value and that's what we've tried to get on with that recommendation so I think by the fact that the management comment says it's going to improve the self-assessment documentation then then it should address it if if within that it, it takes that view of okay so what questions are we asking which of these add value why are we asking them and what is likely to going to be the response we get from those Thank you, because there's certainly a lot of the answers that came back were either yes or no, or just yes, yes. naming a, a directorate, which obviously anybody can put together. It doesn't say anything other than the fact no, that, that you... doesn't, so that doesn't add the value. So how do you take it beyond that and go, OK, it's not a yes, no answer. It's I need to put some narrative around this and really explain what the answer is. If that makes sense. So, so it's for our officers then to take that forward and to um, to actually make sure that this amount of money and this amount of work does actually add that value, which for yeah. me at the moment seems to have not quite managed to fulfil its potential yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Councillor Summers, and then... Thank you, Chair. I was just reading here, it was, all councils are responsible for putting in place proper arrangements to secure economy efficiency and effectiveness from their resources. Now, to my mind, strategic partnerships are resources. Um, and it seems that we have a contracts issue we, and we also have a um, management issue. Now, I think Belfort BT, most of the issues we had, you know, seven years that I know, is basically that we've just manage them very poorly. Uh, council has not managed Belfort BT to make sure that they're doing the job right. Um, and the same thing, and as far as contracts are concerned, I think we probably have an issue with whoever's writing up contracts. Would you suggest, John, that we do something about that or look into that as far as having management in-house that knows their job and can manage these issues? Thank you. I think that's. I think that's. Yes, it's implied in the in the in the recommendations and in the statements that you need to be satisfied that the measures that you do put in place are fit for purpose. And this is probably somewhere that the committee could take further assurance. Then, in terms of the responses to our recommendations, to come back and maybe get more to, to, to sort of delve beneath the detail of, of the management responses and, and get satisfied as a committee uh, that those responses are, um, are what you would expect them to be. Thank you, John. So can I put forth an action that you make sure, I know Ross is, is new to us, but uh, perhaps we can put forth an action to make sure we got management in place that knows the area, knows Herefordshire and can control Belfort Beauty. Anyway. That's my feeling. Thank you. 
I know it's a tough one, but thank you, Councillor Summers. Yes, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a think about how to couch that, uh, that, that, that action to be taken forward. What's the recommendation of the action to be taken forward? Councillor Matthews. Yes, John, in the improvement recommendations on page 148, you mentioned OOPL, which I've always showed a big interest in, and up until recent years, they recorded huge losses year on year. But they are, I'm pleased to say, improving. So I'm glad that you highlighted that. It's a matter that needs attention. And you said you, that the council should strengthen the performance monitoring arrangements for Upal Limited. Um, so uh, having read that and what you're recommending, John, uh, are you uh, informing us or telling us that there's still considerable room for improvement in the management of Upal? Yes, I am. And then that's reflected in the... Um in the management comment as well that the council recognizes this and is going to um, strengthen further the arrangements including the uh, report into the cabinet with uh, quarterly performance management reports i think to, to get the the data around things like um you know response rates speed of performance um quality of performance all, all sorts of um all sorts of metrics that i think could be um could be meaningfully implied yes Thank you, John. I, and thank you for that because it's something that I've been mentioning for a year on, year on for a good many years. And I've always had their annual report. And up until this last few years, it's been extremely worrying. And as I say, I wish you well because it's your last stint with us. So thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I just wanted, um, not necessarily a question for John. I don't, I might be um, asking Andrew Lovegrove, um, I've got two questions um, following on from uh, Councillor Matthews, more around governance. So in terms of governance over Hoople, um, does that, does Hoople now, is, are they included within SWAP's internal audit risking universe? And would we see internal audits over Hoople? And also, how does Hoople fit within our governance structure and say, um, committees such as scrutiny? So would scrutiny have any remit um, to call, to review any items that people? Thank you, I, 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 I need to that I am currently a director of people on behalf of the council, so I have that responsibility as well. And it is something that we're looking at in terms of how we, the council manages its relationship with people limited, because we are the majority shareholder, we own over 80% of it. So, we own the company more than the lion's share of it. And we also commission a range of services from it uh, in terms of services it provides to the council and also sell services to other councils and um, uh, commercial customers on that. In terms of the arrangement at its own internal external orbit arrangement, yeah. so I don't think this committee has uh, the scrutiny of it in traditional sense because it is a company owned by us. But that is one of the pieces of work that we're looking at as a group of officers. We'll make recommendations to cabinet about who the directors are, what role they fulfill, and how the council uh, directs people as a shareholder of people, and then also how council interacts with people as a buyer of services at the moment. Those two things aren't very clear, so that's that's work in progress that we can report. That's something we will uh, address in the coming months deal with. So I probably won't be continuing to be the director of Hoople, but clearly um, we started that because we changed the management structure, so that's why I stepped up to the bridge, but I'm very conscious that I commissioned a range of services from Hoople, uh, including exactly some banks and those kind of things. So I know that's something that is very much um, probably come to report about the changes uh, to that point, but I feel that how it wants to do it. Okay. Um, I'll look forward to seeing that. Uh, just one other um, governance question. Um, uh, I see there's a number of comments in the report about various boards. So we've got, say, the Major Contracts Improvement Board. We've got a Resources Board. We've got a Children's Improvement Board. Um, some of these boards have member attendance. Some of them don't. Um, so I was, from a governance perspective, is there any overview of of that sort of structure of all these boards or improvement boards and any guidance as to when members should be sitting on the boards and when they shouldn't be sitting on the boards. 
and, and Joe, as, as John said, this report comes from quite a long period of time just because of this. <coughs> so some of these boards have sat, have done their job, have closed down, others are ongoing, others are, are, are just getting up to speed. So the Children's Improvement Board and the relationships about the change in Ireland, there's many of the side of this, and the DFB, various scrutiny committees on it. So there is a role for scrutiny to have a boot into that. We've had the conversation earlier on about the role of calling in things. So uh, there's always that opportunity for those arrangements to be called in. In terms of the wider arrangements of both the site of the boards, I think that's something as we move to a different arrangement for scrutiny, probably on their work plan to have a look at. For that, but, um, so, be, so rather than auditing governance and our oversight of governance, it wouldn't necessarily fall to us to look at that. It would be a scrutiny matter. I'm not an expert in, in what we're going to be conscious of, but I think that needs to be outside. And part of that is a conversation whether it sits within this committee's remit or the scrutiny committee. most effective oversight of what's going on. Is that potentially an action item that we just need to bottom out to determine the responsibility, whether it's ours or scrutiny, what can be fed into the scrutiny process? I think it should process? be recorded as an action item and then yeah. we will it. Thank you. Um, Chairman, could I come in there briefly? I totally agree with Vice Chair. Uh, we've, we've passed a lot more responsibility over to Opal over recent times than we. So. A lot more services, so it's essential that they're closely monitored. So if we could have some recommendation which has been proposed that there's a system in place to deal with that because as i say like it's a lot of great payer of money in there with the major shareholder and it's only right and proper that they're very uh, strictly scrutinized thank you uh, thank you councillor matthews I, I was going to push as well um andrew if we were saying we're going to over the coming months come to some sort of clarity over some sort of arrangement. I'm just wondering if we can, can we have a timeline? I think I'm to consult with my legal colleagues for that, but yes, I, I, if that's actually going to come back to I, the I timeline. We'd, we'd like to see a timeline for this. We've been talking about people for, for, for a long, long time. Um, I've got concerns. They are key to some of the most uh, vital mm -hmm. services provided to this council, um, including ICT services. Um, you'd be aware of the problems that Gloucester City Council have been in for the last, since before Christmas, after a, a cyber attack. Um, and, um, you know, they, they, they operate a lot of the backroom services for housing benefit, everything from housing benefit to, to people doing searches on, on when they want to move homes. And, and to have any doubt in our mind about the uh, confidence in, in their ability to uh, provide uh, ongoing service, um, I think is, 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 a, is problematic. It's problematic for me as chair of this committee. Um, it's, probably, it's obviously problematic for, for everyone here. And, um, and with what's happening in, uh, in Eastern Europe at the moment, we, we were anticipating that uh, <laughs> We'll, we'll follow and uh, we need to keep services to our, for our uh, residents. Uh, just one final question then, as, as my, uh, to, to John, as, uh, uh, and uh, I note on page 150, 155 of your report, there are uh, three settlement agreements uh, arrived at with offices in the Council's employment in 2021-22. And just wondering, uh, the public will want to know, um, can we can we have a, a, a quantum for how much uh, that involved and also for public benefit? Those sums are disclosed, I think, in the annual financial statements. Is that right? Note twenty five of the annual financial statements uh, deals with um, deals with disclosures around these. Um, there were two in year, so two two that would have impacted on the um, twenty twenty one accounts. Only one of them actually was necessary to disclose specifically uh, in note 25 and that's um, a matter of public record is £120,000. Um, there was others, now I'm being careful here because obviously we are looking at the, you know, the, the um, confidential, confidentiality uh, responsibilities of, of, of this, this meeting um, and dealing with individuals who've, who've received payments and so on. So I have the information about this. Well, I've got the information about all three, but 
I would rather share that with members, uh, maybe in writing or, or, or separately, if that's okay, Chair. Um, I'd have to take legal advice, but yeah. if, 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 that, if that's necessary, then that's necessary. Kate? Um, yes, um, I'm obviously aware of these settlement agreements and um, if members wanted more detail, we'd have to go into private session um, because there are data protection issues. There are also issues about identifying an individual um, and we'd have to go into private session under Section 12A of the Local Government Act um, uh, because it would, for, for that reason, um, uh, but the uh, information that needs to be in the public domain is in the public domain. Thank you. I was just trying to identify the overall content rather than identify individual officers. Mm. And that was, yeah. so, okay. uh, well, the, the highest one is the, is the one that was disclosed in the accounts, okay. I believe. Okay. Um, the, yeah, and, and I can confirm for the committee that they've, they've been the two that were impacting the 2021 accounts were correctly accounted for. Thank you. Um, if there's no more questions, John. Um, Thank you very much. Um, we thank you for your many years of due diligence and service to uh, Herefordshire Council and uh, wish you well in, uh, in, uh, in your other roles going forwards. And uh, we look forward, I'm sure, to, to working with uh, Pete Barber um, and, uh, and the team uh, in the future. Um, thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Jay. I've, I've really enjoyed working with the council, I have to say. Uh, do we have a, a record of any other uh, actions or uh, recommendations? Uh, Chad, the um, you, I'm actually full of officers. Okay, so someone's uh, point about um, asking for details of uh, the arrangements and arrangements of key contracts in relation to BPLP. I um, don't know if you want to define that any further in terms of what, what, what's been asked for. I suppose we could ask management to comment. Um, on the uh, on the points made by the external auditor and how they intend to ensure uh, improvement in management of key contracts going forwards, which gives them the opportunity to talk about knowledge and uh, competency. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and um, the other ones was regarding the um, asking for further details of governance arrangements for the great oversight of companies influenced by councils such as Super Limited and internal bodies such as the Prudent Board. Yeah, I think I've, with, with, a, with, a, with an indication of timeline or when these will be introduced. Thank you. Content with those. Yep. Thank you. Um, and we'll move on to uh, agenda item seven. Not going backwards. Rethinking governance. Um, the purpose of this is to consider the suggested amendments to the council's constitution proposed by the Rethinking Governance member and officer working group for recommendation to council. We have uh, two, two uh, recommendations on the paper in front of us. Um, I'll read those out very briefly. Having regard to the work undertaken by the Rethinking Governance Working Group, the Audit and Governance Committee functions are set out in Appendix 1, and the two proposed changes to the Constitution set out in paragraphs 9 and 10 be recommended to full council for adoption with implementation in effect from 20th May 2022. And B, authority be delegated to the Director of Governance and Legal Services to make technical amendments as required by law, grammatical formatting, consistency necessary to finalise and revise the Constitution. Um, the documents are with you. Um, I think it's Appendix 1 that we're dealing with. Uh, um, we have both the 
clean version and the, um, the version which has the uh, background of what changes made. Um, what I propose to do, since we've all had this, is just to go through the six pages um, of the appendix one functions and ask if there are any comments on each page that Kitty wish to make. So, beginning at um, page 25 of our pack, um, section five of the functions, appendix one. Um, are there any comments at all on, on that page? No. And page uh, 26. No. Don't keep up with it. It's all right. Otherwise, I'll be coming back. I've got one comment on page 27, 3.5.13. Um, in the second paragraph, sorry. Uh, in the in the first part, last sentence of the first paragraph, I think the the capacity the independent dictionary of writing is the correct usage rather than the independent person. Uh, yeah. That's a Thank you. I just have two questions. And um, first of all, three, five, eleven. We've got some crossed out words as necessary, which I imagine need to be removed. Um, but three, five, thirteen. Um, could Kate? Could you just explain again um, the difference between uh, an independent person and the independent expert? Because from what I understand, the Constitution allows us to have an independent person on our committee. Um, so if you could just explain the difference between the two again, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, Chair, if I may. Um, the independent persons are those that are appointed under the Localism Act, and um, we're required to have at least one independent person, um, and they're set out at um, 4.9.26 um, of the Constitution. As I understood it, as part of drafting these terms and conditions, um, this is where the committee was looking to have an independent expert, not an independent person. Um, because the independent person is specifically defined by the legislation. This is somebody that you can, as a committee, invite to your committee to advise and support you. So that's why I've um, identified, um, I've highlighted in this second paragraph of 3.5.13 that this person is not um, one of the independent persons that the council is required to have under the Localism Act. Does that answer your question, Councillor um, Balderson? In the Constitution, do we define anywhere what an independent expert is? No, there is no, no. And could an independent expert also be an independent person? Um, the, independent, the independent persons are used for specific purposes. They're used for um, investigations into um, disciplinary matters, which are set out in the Constitution. And they're also used under the Localism Act specifically as well for investigating code of conduct complaints. Um, so um, the um, independent person, um, we have to have a minimum of one. We could extend them to say we have an independent person who supports the um, uh, Audit and Governance Committee, um, but that would just be a, spe a specified person because we don't um, actually recruit them with specific skills set to advise um, your committee. So do we need to have a section in the constitution that defines an independent expert? Um, um, Councillor Jim is just highlighting a TV error. So uh, do we need to explain within the constitution what it defines what an independent expert is? It, it probably it would be helpful to be, give greater clarity um, in the difference between a person and an expert. Um, for uh, for these purposes, yeah. Be an expert on experience. Thank you. Thank you. I know that we are at two thirty now, and but sorry, 
Just to comment on that point, I mean, an expert normally in terms of any expert witness position is one that is recognized by the court on the day as holding that position. I suspect in this instance, we are in the same grounds where we're saying would be recognized by the committee as being an expert. You see Kate's nodding, as a, but, but that would be normally how it would be dealt with in the court. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we've reached 2.30. I need to ask if we can extend the meeting till three o'clock. Can we, yeah. can we put some of this back to the next meeting? Yeah. No, We'll see where we are by three. Thank you. I'll probably have to leave in call and have a chat. Sure. Well, thank you for your forbearance. Councillor Jim. Um, can we? Yeah. yeah, I think the important point there is can the independent expert also be an independent person? We just need to clarify whether they can hold two positions at the same time. My answer to that is no, but it needs to be clear that they can't. Um, the other point was um, 3, 5, 4, 15, and 14. On 14, it says the committee will meet approximately eight times a year, approximately eight times a year, and a quorum of three. Um, is there any, I couldn't see there was anywhere in here where the committee could decide that it needed to meet itself. In other words, how it determines when it meets. So if it was called by two or more committee members as needing to meet, is that something that we should be writing in on this committee? And the second was the to review matters. And I considered there that perhaps there should be review and where required in depth examine any matters that council or committee, including A and G, agree need further scrutiny or explanation. It's just being clear what consider means in the context of the year. Yeah. Kate, could you give a view on, on the manner in which the, 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 a, a meeting of audit and governance can be called? At the moment, it, it, it is left as scheduled meeting as agreed within the um, working paper. Yeah, thank you. There's no ability for me or three or four members of committee or members to call a meeting of the audit and governance committee. Um, chairman, as if as chairman of the committee, you could ask for an extra meeting. Um, if your committee asked you, you could ask for an extra meeting if that was necessary. Um, in terms of um, Councillor Jinman's amendment, I wasn't quite clear, Councillor Jinman, which paragraph you were referring to. Is that 3515? I was just taking it beyond review into um, a stronger format where required in depth examine. So review tends to imply that you are given the, the, the material, whereas if you examine, you actually seek it out yourself, take witnesses or whatever. <laughs> I don't have um, I don't have a, a, an issue with that. That would be if the committee would um, agree to that, then uh, um, you could that amendment. Is committee happy with taking that as an amendment? <laughs> I'd just like to comment on this expert nonsense. You can recall, Chairman, we had a, a, a economist uh, from London or somewhere who supposedly was an expert back several months ago, and according to him, inflation was to be stable at 1%, interest was blah, 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 blah. Well, I pointed out difficulties around the world. Oh, no, no, no. And if that's the definition of an expert, well, you can keep them. <laughs> so I'm always very dubious about these people as so-called experts. They're usually orientated to one view, and that's their own, you know. There we are. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, we we uh, yeah. we'll, um, we'll we'll bear that in mind. Um, I did touch on that right. We touched on we were to three o'clock. Are, are you satisfied, Councillor Jim? Are, are we happy to take that as a, an amendment to um, three five fifteen A? 
to review and to review and examine. And, and where required in depth examine. Okay. We're content. Thank you. With that, over the page to page 28. Any comments on 28? Twenty-nine. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, I, I raised this previously. That why do we name a specific company? So reviewing conjunctural exam, advising council of labour, the risk being poor result of funding provided with council to that particular company. Now I appreciate that's part of a waste contract when supplies it's in a constitution. It, because to me, it's not a constitutional matter, it's an action that it should be outside of that. It is. Historically, it's in our uh, remit because it was a specific um, action based on the audit committee by council. And so the council named Bosio um, Waste Management Limited in the action that it put upon us. Um, hence, we have continued to name it. Now, I look to um, legal and perhaps an 051 officer as to whether there should be a name there. But other than a change of environment or a change of contract, I can't see that name changing. The contract is, a, is the BFI contract that we're responsible to, to manage, uh, responsible to examine. But that's my understanding, Chair. I, it was a specific recommendation to council to this company, whereas um, yeah, if that company was to change, I think we'd be going back to council for the council to agree an amendment. So I think that the reason for a named company is because that's what council agreed. And if it's for any confusion, if there were changes that end, that would have to be done through council. But, uh, so it's it's there by exception. Yes. Right. Sorry. 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 So, do you, so if, you, if this person, these companies lost that contract, you'd have to bring in a new constitution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's work. Just take their name out of it. It's not a traditional contracting arrangement because they're a PFI provider and we're acting as the funder. So we're actually as a bank lending that company money right. rather than their contractor. They also have a contractual relationship, which makes it confusing because they deal with the waste disposal. But this is the uh, yeah. council's role as the funder to lend them some money and they have to follow that. So that, that's why it's a very precise description because so your role is to oversee that, that part of the transaction rather than them to deliver the, the, the service on the ground. So just to come back to that, so on the same basis, we ought to have a clause with regard to Hoople. Uh, we don't have a PFI relationship. No, but we have a relationship and we lend them money and they take money. Uh, well, we don't lend them money in the way that this does, but, but I think that as we discussed, that that's the piece of work we need to come back for that clarity to make the relationship with people. So that, that, that's how sort of, uh, we it, it just seems unusual in a constitution to name a, like, a specific company. But thank you for the explanation of how it got there. Whether that was wise is another matter. Uh, but that's where we are. Um, if I could just add as well, I think other, um, there are other people in the loan arrangement, yes. other councils, and they actually have a specific committee just to deal with this issue. So rather than having a specific committee, which would be in our constitution, um, we have taken it within the audit committee. So we haven't set up a separate committee to deal with it. So um, it's probably less onerous than what some other councils do. Thank you. Uh, page 30. One. I've got I've got one on thirty one, but it's it's just a spelling error. 
and 3.5.30 i, which is very much French. Councillor Dawson. Um, I have a comment that would normally be on page 30, but we've taken it out of page 30. Um, initially, we discussed how treasury management as um, a function of working governments, and it um, was discussed in the working group, and um, it was determined uh, that the best place would be with the new scrutiny management board, because the scrutiny management board will be overseeing the budget process and the treasury um, papers form part of the budget papers that then go to full council. Um, so in previous versions that you may have seen of this, we had sections somewhere in around here, um, including treasury management, um, but it's no longer there for that particular reason because it's going to be picked up. Uh, it was recommended that it be picked up by scrutiny management board. In saying that, I just wanted to ask Kate whether um, we don't have section four scrutiny functions in this pack, but would it be appropriate because all and governments have identified that the scrutiny or oversight of the treasury management um, is potentially a gap and does need to be undertaken by somebody and it's not us. So it, we're recommending the regional governance group is recommending that it's the scrutiny management board. Should we actually be putting comments or in section four scrutiny functions to pick up on the fact that we're expecting scrutiny management board to undertake treasury management work. Uh, so Councillor Bolson, if I've understood you correctly, section four of the constitution, are you saying, or section four of this? Uh, section four scrutiny functions, so not, um, which we don't have. Which we don't um, have. Yeah. this was just to deal with this was just dealing with the audit and governance functions so um as part of the um report that goes to full council in may um uh, which will have the new constitution which will have picked up the rethinking governance um uh, uh, sorry picked up full council's approval in uh, march and also these amendments it will have in it the scrutiny management um section four functions um but I recognise your nervousness at not having seen them um, before this goes to full council. Yeah. Could we, could we check it by taking an action that um, the uh, Treasury Management functions should be confirmed as being in section four when the constitution is approved? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. the, uh, over the page 32, uh, in fact, it's uh, an error that was already in the Constitution. Um, I, second line, uh, should be R, not R's, discharging the duty. Uh, should be R, R discharging the duty. It's discharging the duty. Can you, can you, a question, yeah. please. But when we actually put the health and well-being board functions as a community, they're not our functions. They're not your functions. But, but, but our function is to review the constitution, which is why it's under there. A moment ago, we had to review the contract because the named companies in it. Now we've got the health and wellbeing board functions under our functions, but we're not reviewing it. No, it's not under our functions. It's in it's in section. section five, other functions. Or it's in three five twenty eight. It follows on from three five twenty six. These are a list of the functions of, according to. How this has been set out. I mean, I I didn't think this was our function, and I thought that should have been in a separate section, just as planning is for planning. Planning and regulatory committees three five one three point five point one. Yeah. And then all that done is function three five eight started three point five point eight. So it's picking up other functions in order. 
So this whole appendix cover, covers other functions of which auditing governance is one of the functions. Yeah, it, it's confusing because 3.5.8 is auditing governance functions. It's then gone into whatever flows on beyond that, you assume is the functions. So internal audit, external audit, governance, etc. Place contract, code of conduct, and then suddenly we're going to hit things which we're going to say are not part of the functions. And it should be that should be a separate entity if they are not a function to this committee. Thank you, Chairman, can, can I um, can I recommend something? Um, I'm uh, I absolutely understand where Councillor Jinman is um, is at because when I came to the council and and read these, yeah, I would you would think that the functions do flow. So I'm wondering. Um, there are two things we are doing a constitutional review for the um uh for um later on in the year and we can pick up these comments in terms of how the numbering doesn't work and doesn't support um, the title i'm wondering for the purposes of clarity um and if um for consideration by the committee that um audit and government fun functions um, it actually sets out that they are set out in paragraphs um, 3.5.9 to um, 3.5.25, um, and we add that we add that sentence in today, um, and then we can pick up all the numbering um, and presentation when we do our constitutional review later on in the year. Makes sense to me. It makes sense. It's clear okay. then that those are the functions of this committee. The others are extra. Yeah. But Thank it you. still needs to say who has responsibility for them, which will follow presumably when you review that. Just a brief question on 3.511, Chairman. Uh, to help maintain its independence, the committee is able to meet privately and separately with external auditors and the head of internal audit, etc. etc. Has that ever happened? Have we ever taken that opportunity up to meet the external audit privately? Um, I'm not sure we've done that as a committee. I've certainly done it. I've certainly met with the head of external audit. Do you, do you think, in the, particularly with a new one, it would be a good idea to have him in for an hour? And uh... well, I think I think we need to be certain as to why we wanted him in, not not just over. Well, we could chat. we could soon think of something. I'll, um, no, well, I'll I think I, I, no, well, no, no, I think it's there, and, it, and yeah. I just think well, we've never done that. No, Even in question. all these difficult situations, we've never. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, I mean, it, it, it's usually when there are issues uh, that you want to raise um, outside the officer call with the external auditor. And what issues did you raise? With? <laughs> <laughs> Those need to remain confidential. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, do we have do we have some um, the recommendations as provided in the document, the general item seven? There was at least one other um, action, I think. Uh, yes, indeed, and you're recommending um, uh, some further wording changes in terms of what well, we're seeking a, in terms of uh, 3.513, the definition of that and an expert to, to specify that and learn a few more words. Um, 3.515a, in terms of to review and examine and where required in depth exam and access rating to et etc. Um, and then the, uh, the amendment you identified uh, on uh, 3.530i. Um, and um, in terms of actions uh, that we can run the treasury management functions that's included in section four scrutiny functions as functions of the treasury management board and the treatment council just so we can track that through and make sure that's been uh, done. Um, and then also in the further constitutional review, the presentation of the audit government functions um, be considered to separate them from, from other functions. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to take an action. Well, well just right. uh, put an action down that committee consider um, consider consider any items that they wish to discuss um, independently with um, the new uh, external audit. So, yeah, if you want to put that there, but I'm. I'm 
the committee need to come forward with some suggestions. I, 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 I want to see uh, what, what it was that we wanted to discuss. Uh, you no, know, I just noticed it in there, and I've never noticed the opportunity taken. There's been reasons for it over the past year or so, and I just wondered why we've never taken up that opportunity of having him yeah. privately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's can I just so, so, sorry, Councillor Summers? Yeah, the clinical commissioning group is will be no longer uh, exchanging. So, what, what section are you in? Uh, I it's in uh, you just mentioned the alcohol wellbeing board. I even continue as a program to which council the clinical commissioning group, or not just commissioning board. Well, commissioning group, see this. Will no longer be it's changing the stain or it's becoming something totally different. So I can't think of the name now. We discuss it on the means of effort. It was today, and I can't think of the name now, but it's, it won't be the clinical commissioning group anymore. I, I, hopefully, that um, the recommendation of authority be delegated to the Director of Government's Legal Service to make technical amendments as required by law will cover that. Okay. Because it will be a different, yeah, a different body. Yeah. yeah. Body is like the department for uh, it is and yeah. whatever it is changed there, and yeah. it's pretty regular. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Are we content with those changes? Those um, options? Yeah. So, one for Jimmy. So, it's a, just we're going on in, I was going on into the next piece, which has got the track changes to try and see if there's anything there that I highlighted. One was can the committee actually meet if the chair or vice chair are not present? Because at the moment it says you can't meet. It says you have to have the chair or vice chair present. And it did strike me there might be occasions when neither could be present, in which case can the committee uh, elect a chair on the day for it to be carried through? My understanding, and I may be wrong, but was that uh, as long as the committee is quiet, it can elect the chair. Uh, from our six members to, to, to be chair. Kate's nodding. Kate's nodding. <laughs> That's, yeah. That was in my understanding, but when I looked at the track changes, 3514, the committee will meet, you know, because you've got to keep flicking backwards and forwards, yeah. and I apologise, I may, it may not be in the actual. The committee will meet approximately 30, three, eight times a year and quorum of three elected members, including the chair or vice chair. So in other words, you couldn't do it if they weren't there. But you actually elect a chair. But that's not what it says. It says including the chair or vice chair is required for decision. What that is, if chair, if I may help, what that is saying is that the chair and vice chair can be part of the quorum of three. Yes, but I'm saying if they're absent, then the committee then can't make decisions, even though you might have a quorum of members. Yeah, because you will appoint a chair and a vote chair for me. I understand Kate's comment. It's it's um, so the members include a chair or vice chair. I think we just if you deleted that, Kate. Yes. I I I think that's not that I agree with that. If we delete those those um, uh, <laughs> words in the parenthesis, we'll delete those. Yeah. Thank you. I just throw something else, and it's maybe a bit of a negative, but because we're everything's changing, now, we seem to see. But it says that quorum of three includes the chair and the vice chair. Now, in past, we just deleted that. The whole thing the the in includes the chair or vice chair. That within brackets has now been deleted. Okay, because in the past, because the vice chair and chair work very close with the officer, and we bet that in the past is with the children's. They're, they may be a little bit biased, so then when there's only one other committee member to vote, it's kind of one-sided. So I'm just, uh, no, I'm, you know, this is a sticky one, I know. But if we're changing the process, yeah, but we're still human beings. And we still get biases from, so when, because the chair and the vice chair work with the officer on, on things. Okay, so they're going to get some biases. So when it comes to their vote, they're going to maybe vote, I'm not saying they do, so don't quote me on this. But there might be a biased vote. So if there's only one other committee member, 
it's kind of lopsided. Anyway, that's just some things that I'm throwing in there just to stir the pot bit, maybe, but no, I think it is an issue. Something for, um, hmm? for uh, the review of governance to consider. And by removing what's in the appendices, we get it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's but just by removing that, we get out the court. Yes. Okay. Well, well, the further point was Jay in, uh, oh, where am I? Let's track the 18, 3518 governance. We referred to Caldercott Guardian, but don't get a capital, capital letter. That's another matter. But when did we actually talk to them? Who is our Caldercott Guardian? And when have we actually talked to them? Do you have that information? Um, I'm afraid um, that's uh, that that stumped me as well, Councillor um, Jinman. We'll need to find out who the count the uh, Caldicott Guardian is. Um, so we'll have to take that away. It just seems that if we're supposed to be saying we're receiving their reports, we need to make sure that we do see these various people's reports. That includes equality and compliance manager reviews. Yeah, we'd have to refer to the annual government statement. That should, should be the annual government statement. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I think it would be wise if we uh, make sure we sign off what we say we're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If we're all content with that, agenda item seven and the action statement. The last action. Well. Yeah, the last action. Okay, thank you. Four minutes. Agenda item eight, code of conduct. Uh, we need to complete this one at least because this needs to go to uh, the council. Uh, past three, three I'm afraid we're going to have to go past three o'clock. So I've got nods from at least three of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. I don't think we'll necessarily need you. Uh, code of conduct. Um, to present the audit governance committee to the audit committee. annual report. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Chairman, do you need me to introduce the report or members uh, need time to read it? If you wouldn't mind to introduce the report, we've got two recommendations. Um, I do have a comment. Uh, we have received a comment from uh, Councillor Harvey um, relatively late. Um, uh, let's, we've had the Code of Conduct report. Um, it's spoken about before. Um, okay, if, if I don't cover a point, just, just come in. Um, this new expanded uh, and uh, uh, code of conduct uh, report um, and uh, the um, model arrangements were based on the new LGA code, which has been widely consulted on. We, as a council, have consulted on the code with parish councils and members and have made amendments, uh, principally as defined in Appendix 4, to create our own model code, which essentially is the LGA code of conduct with modifications. It's Appendix 3, Chairman. Um, right, appendix 3, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Appendix 3 that we're... Um, Approving, but I think the changes, the, the differences between the uh, Appendix 3 and uh, uh, the LGA code are as specified laid out in Appendix 4, which was subsequently distributed to the committee um, as a late paper. The parish councils and town councils can adapt our code. Um, they can adopt the LGA code, they can adopt our code, 
or they can make their own code. I understand anecdotally that some have already adopted the LGA code. Um, just to refer to the note that you've received, um, Councillor Harvey has lately advised an amendment that you'd like to make to our code, and you would receive by email her detailed reasons for this. And I'm open to receiving this amendment as a recommendation. Perhaps um, from a member of the committee to um, uh, provide it using Councillor Harvey's proposed wording. Now, although the um, monitoring officer recommendation, I think, is to follow the LGA arrangements pending their consultation with government about amendments to the Local Reason Act, if the committee decide to adopt the amendments suggested by Councillor Harvey, it, it really would not be material to the code as we implemented it um, for our purposes. Uh, parish councils and town councils still don't have to follow the sanction recommended by the monitoring officer. Um, now, I don't know whether we want to, um, whether the committee wants to raise comments on the code as is and then deal with a potential amendment. Would that be the best way of dealing with this? So any questions on the code as is presented to us as Appendix 3 of our pack? Um, yes, I just have a couple of questions. So, um, Kate, from, from reading this new code of conduct, must we form an assessment committee um, as a result of this? And, I, and I'm also reading that there'll be no appeals. So I know we very rarely hold appeals, but we've been holding an appeal recently. Um, so do we need to form an assessment committee? And does this mean that we wouldn't have and um, have to have um, an appeal to them. Um. So, Bolton, if I've understood your questions correctly, you're asking, do we, um, should we have an assessment committee um, and, um, and also appeals? We currently have appeals and the LGA is recommending no appeals. Um, so, um, can I just clarify with you, um, if you can help me, what do you mean by assessment committee? Oh, I think it was in the wording. I, I, I can go to another question and I will find the exact page reference. I don't um, have it. Um. Uh, to answer the question in relation to appeals, um, Herefordshire Council um, made a decision, I understand historically, to um, uh, enable um, a subject member and or a complainant, depending on satisfying certain criteria, to appeal the um, monitoring officer um, decision. Um, so just to give members some background, before uh, when a complaint comes in, it's initially assessed by um, uh, access to information to make sure it's on the right form, um, and um, it clearly ticks, um, there's a complainant and a complainant and somebody being complained about, it then comes to democratic services and a lawyer will then look at the complaint to um, see if it is um, does amount to a potential breach of the Nolan principles and the code of conduct. And if that's the case, then um, the independent independent persons will be consulted and we do have four independent persons and they are then consulted on the um, complaint as it's set out um, and then um, if the complaint then proceeds to further desktop investigation by um, a um, either myself as deputy monitoring officer um, or um, our assistant monitoring uh, deputy monitoring officers or other lawyers um, with experience in um, code of conduct complaints and we arrive at a decision um, uh, and we would and if we accept the complaint um, as needing to be further to be investigated then we ask the subject member for their comments um, and we take all that evidence into account on a desktop basis um, and ma uh, make a decision now that's when the appeal process can come in that um, 
either party subject to certain criteria can then appeal that decision. That appeal then is heard by a standards panel and the standards panel is made up of members of this committee and also the independent persons and they then actually hear here, um, the appellants um, appeal against the monitoring officer's um, decision um, and the monitoring officer's decision isn't published, um, it isn't published, made public um, until the outcome of that appeal. Um, now what the LGA is saying is that the, um, that the uh, decision process, the decision making process regarding complaints, there should be no right of appeal because um, A, the legislation doesn't provide for it um, and um, uh, there are no sanctions, real statutory right to imposing sanctions um, uh, by the monitoring officer and, um, and also it is consulting with um, government and also the um, local government ombudsman that the local government ombudsman might be the final arbiter um, of, um, uh, of uh, complaint hearing um, appeals on complaints but at the moment it's recommending no appeals um, uh, should be heard as part of the um, internal process for determining code of conduct complaints. Councillor Balderson, does that? Yes, thank you. Um, and I think my assessment committee question was on page 66. Um, so it talks about where in authorities where the assessment is carried out by a committee. Right. Which version we want? Appendix. Page 66 about that. Oh, no, it's not page 66 about uh, that. It's no. page, yes, sir. 63 refers to. Uh, I'm looking at page 66. Appendix yeah, one, though, isn't it? Uh, Which we'll use it. Appendix two. Appendix two, page 66. Is that the um, assessment paragraph, which says assessment, initial assess, initial tests, the assessment yeah. of a complaint would normally be a two-step process. That, that is, yeah, yeah. And, and in the paragraph above that, in, in authorities where the assessment is carried out by a committee rather than not, sir. So we, um, do we need, if we take on the new code, um, do we need to... Uh, review whether the assessment is done by committee or um, can we still follow the current process which you just described where the monitoring officer um, confers with the independent person? Um, this um, this uh this, this pre-assessment, um, it relates to pre-assessment inquiries um, and um, reports. Um, uh, at the moment, we're not proposing to having a pre-assessment committee. We're, pro we're proposing that it's um, our, the pre-assessment that we do, which is called the initial assessment um, stage, which is looked at by officers and independent persons. Um, they look at those complaints um, and, um, and then it carries on to monitoring officer. Um, and for them to make the resolution. There was, and then we have a, what's called a standards panel that then can, um, then um, the monitoring officer can say that actually this complaint is too serious enough for me to just make a decision on my own. Actually, this needs to be referred, this needs to go to formal investigation. Um, and therefore that's when we get beyond desktop investigation, we get into witness, witness evidence um, and we get into a further in, uh, investigative officer um, usually another local authority does that um, and then there's a report to a standards panel and the standards panel then make their assessment so um, there are some councils that actually don't have standards panels um, they have um, they have different types um, uh, of of panels and do their assessments differently, but we're not proposing to change that process um, that we've got because we feel that um, if we pick up the initial assessment stage within an independent review through the independent persons. Thank you, Kate. And I have one last question, just on the independent persons. One of the things that I think Councillor Harvey raised was um, uh, the independent, per the monitoring officer 
um, can get advice from the independent person. But in terms of um, uh, the individual's um, subject uh, involved in the complaint, um, whether they would have access to an, an independent person as well to give them advice, and whether actually we need to have a minimum of two independent persons. So there's uh, one person advising the council, one person advising uh, the individual. So we currently, we statutorily have to have at least one person. Herefordshire Council um, has currently got four independent persons um, and um, we split those into two teams, team A and team B team. And so that we get, um, so that we can get some, uh, we don't get a conflict in terms of any views um, uh, shared for this reason, that um, two of those independent persons will give their initial view on the complaint as it comes in. And that is the, the monitoring officer then um, will use that um, in terms of guiding them in terms of how the complaint might be handled or the decision they arrived at and then the other two independent persons are available if the subject member wants um, the wants um, to access um, the, the critical friend um, then they can access um, one of those two um, subject members so we currently have a process whereby we have at least um, at least one but in more than likely four, if not more. It all depends on um, how, how many we can recruit. I think Councillor Balderson's point is that somewhere constitutionally, we should say we have at least two. So there's one for um, the council and one for um, the person being complained about. And at the moment, it's possible that we only have one. And in fact, we have only had one for quite a period of time. So uh, we can we can um, we can look to um, uh, um, add an addendum to the um, to the guidance, um, the arrangements to say that we have um, uh, we will have at least two um, uh, independent and persons. That, that, would, be, that, that would satisfy. Um, I think, yes. Yes, please. Okay. Chairman, can I ask Kate, in your view, Kate, is the system as it is now working satisfactory? The system as it's working now satisfactory? Did that the question you asked, Councillor? Um, yeah. Um, the, um, this, the system is... Um, the system that we've got is... Um, it doesn't... The monitoring officer doesn't have any sanctions. So complaints that come in and when they're breaches of code of conduct then um, there are no sanctions that have got um, real bite. Um, and um, so that is an issue for a lot of monitoring officers. In terms of the day-to-day -day system as to how we operate it in Hereford, um, actually, um, we um, have got a significant number of complaints and they're parish council complaints and they're growing. Um, and actually it's about having enough resource to, um, for those complaints. Um, and because the principal authority is responsible for um, looking and looking at and investigating complaints of parish um, and um, town councils. So, um, and we're regularly keeping the standards committee um, uh, updated, and we come to you as an audit committee in terms of how that pro how that is working. And the last audit committee. Um, uh, I believe made some recommendations in terms of how we report to you on um, timescales um, and number of complaints that we've got. So it's um, it's comfortable at the moment, Councillor Matthews, um, uh, in terms of Herefordshire's process. Um, and this is we were able just to go a bit further. We were, had the opportunity to share with the um, Centre for um, uh, the Committee on Public standards of life and also the LGA, the process that we use in Hereford, and they've adopted many of our recommendations. So um, it feels comfortable and they liked it as well. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Councillor Sons. This is just a question outside of this. I, I've heard twice now that the problem is a lot, a lot of the problems are now with parish councils. I guess a lot of infighting going on. Uh, what is Hart doing? Do we have any say over what Hark is recommending or what they're doing because they you know they're getting fees from all of these parish councils and with all the infighting I'm hearing about parish councils surely we need to be looking into this anyway it seems to be getting out of hand from time to time. Thanks. 
And so, yeah, so, the, uh, only, and so the only support we can provide to parish councils is training. Um, so we can go out and do training. Um, if they engage HALC, um, then that they they rely on the advice that um, HALC have given them. Um, so um, and some clerks will um, will very often try um, will often come to us for some advice. Um, but most of the time they they're using HALC or um, other associations for the parish councils. Um, but what we encourage parish councils to do is to invite us to come along and give them training on code of conduct issues um, and also code of conduct um, managing code of conduct complaints. Thank you. So uh, if I can just turn to the, uh, the amendment as proposed, uh, I'll propose it myself um, to page 105. Um, and it comes at the third paragraph from the bottom. Uh, beginning note that where the subject member is a parish or town councillor, the matter is referred back to the, their council to say that a breach of code has been found and with a recommended sanction. The town or parish council must then meet to consider whether to impose that sanction. And the amendment is to exclude the words or to replace it with another relevant sanction. They cannot overturn the fact, finding that there has been a breach of the code and the amendment goes forward to exclude the words and if they wish to impose a different sanction, they should seek advice from the clerk and or the monitoring officer. That's the proposal and uh, we've had a comment from the monitoring officer on that proposal that it is in order for the committee to accept it. Um, I don't know if Kate, you want to comment any further on that. Um, I, only to say that um, the um, I gave some advice um, earlier today that um, uh, the um, the way that um, code of conduct and particularly sanctions um, is dealt with is that it's set out in um, statute. It's a localism act um, that sets out um, the conduct of complaints. Um, and currently there are no statutory provisions um, enabling sanctions to be applied. Um, and, um, and parish councils and town councils um, have to adopt a code of conduct, but they don't have to adopt um, the principal council's code of conduct and they don't have to therefore follow the principal council's arrangements for dealing with those complaints. So, um, uh, so even if a parish council took the decision that it wanted to apply a different sanction, currently there is nothing in the legislation stopping them from doing that. What is um, what would um, be um, what might um, encourage them not to is that they uh, could be at risk of JR um, in terms of the decision that that they applied. That if the sanction they applied was not a relevant sanction, and just to give uh, members an indication of what the LGA think relevant sanctions are, they're set out at page one hundred five and the paragraph above the one that Councillor Harvey is suggesting is amended. Um, and if they sought to oppose um, any, um, any different sanctions, then they would be at risk of uh, legal challenge. Um, so um, currently, um, the, um, that's why this um, paragraph is as drafted as it is, um, because there is no statutory um, entitlement for um, parishes to change the recommendations, and they just need to be careful if they did. And that's why they're asked to consult the monitoring officer. Thank you, but there's no um, there's no impediment to adopting the amendment as suggested by Gatsari in terms of our code. No, it, it, there's no in, there's no imped, in, impediment for Hereford to adopt to adopt that, but it's whether the parish councils, if they adopt if they adopted it, whether they would accept it. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's up to the committee to decide whether or not to accept the uh, to accept the amendment as 
tabled. Uh, I don't know whether the committee need to discuss this further. Are you happy with it, Chair? I am content with it um, in that there is an ongoing um, discussion between the LGA and um, the government about further consultation of the Localism Act. Um, Kate, I don't know whether you can comment any further on that, that, that discussion, those discussions which are ongoing, which might well see a, uh, a replacement for this code of conduct within, um, I don't know what, 18 months, two years, I don't know what the time scale is. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the time scale is different because it's taken uh, a while to get us to this stage as well. Um, however, what I do know is the government have um, have just responded on um, many of the recommendations um, and um, the recommendation that they're not prepared to change is that parish councils adopt the principal, principal council's um, constitution. They're saying that parish councils should have the should have the ability to choose what um, code of conduct they have depending on their local circumstances. Um, in relation to sanctions, what they have said is that they will re -look, they will look at the relevant statutory pr provision because the um, uh, the LGA and um, the Centre, uh, the um, Committee on Standards Life, were recommending that parish councils are required to follow the recommendation of the monitoring officer in relation to code of conduct complaints, and that's because of the recent cases on um, uh, on Harvey against Leg, Brianne Taylor. Um, but um, uh, the government have said that they hadn't got any plans to amend the Localism Act, but they will revisit this at some point, but they haven't said when. Councillor uh, Thank you. I mean, I'm perfectly happy to support your uh, proposal, but I mean, I do think this whole paragraph is in really in question because the, the line the town of parish council must meet to whether to impose that sanction. It starts out with the premise that they have the right to overturn the sanction. Not overturn the uh, the decision that the breach has occurred, but they can overturn or not impose a sanction. Whatever you do with them that flows afterwards, the pa parish should also ask the parish of town council to report back to the monitoring office in three months when they met to discuss the sanction if necessary to write again once the sanction has been fulfilled. But they decide not to impose it, they're not going to do any of that. So the breach will be there. It's not a very satisfactory. Uh, process at all, in all honesty. And it does need looking at, I'm perfectly happy in the meantime to certainly agree that to replace it with another relevant sanction seems to me a, a, an onus a, a, too far. And, and the idea that you could have a judgment made and then overturn it in a, in a council afterwards, which could be done on any sort of partiality grounds you want to think of, seems to me to be a most un, un, unacceptable form of justice. But that's uh, uh, something I think beyond today. So I'll support your, your point that I'm uncomfortable with the, the procedure anyway. Councillor okay. Summers. Basically what Peter said, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't have any teeth. So, you know, yeah. to, to put extra writing in with no teeth doesn't make sense to me. It's just, I have enough trouble reading this stuff as it is, you know? Anyway, thanks. Thank you, sir. Shall we move? Move the amendment. Happy. Thank you. Are there any other... Uh, any other recommendations other than uh, recommendations A and B in the papers before us? I think, I think there was one further one, if I recall. Now, I've got so, so many versions, it's yeah. quite difficult to follow it up. But there was one that's always been a particular point of contention, and I know in Herefordshire was picked up originally. And that was membership of closed organisations, in which we've taken the line that that should not be something that would be, that should be disclosable. Yeah. It will always be a very good and, yeah. and transparent. And, and indeed, it is included. If, if, if you look at uh, Appendix 4. 
Uh, I'm hoping uh, four got it because three didn't. Yeah, it's <laughs> a supplement to the agenda. Um, uh, the local amendment um, C4 um, includes uh, other registrable interests, table two interests. Anybody is not open to the public without formal membership. So that is included. I'm, been, I'm pleased to see that. that. Yes, indeed, I've picked it up now. I've got well, four, <laughs> version four. Uh, I'm pleased to see that in there. I think that's something which we've always been keen to, to see there and it seems to me to go to the very essence of being trying to be as open as we can. Yeah, as fast as possible. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got recommendation, recommendation A, B, and uh, recommendation C, I suppose, which is the... Uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's probably uh, just in uh, recommendation B, is to, which says that the, the LJ on the range of being the code conduct complaints is adopted and applied to the new complaints received after 20th May, subject to an addendum to specify that the local arrangements will involve at least two independent persons. Uh, and to amend the section on sanctions as you identify the meeting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can I just raise one further point? Mm -hmm. Can I raise one further point on this registrable um, interest? I wasn't clear in this whether somebody who is a vlogger would actually be registering the facts. In other words, I'm trying to bring us up to date in terms of social media and influencers as to whether or not that becomes a registrable interest, because these are massive potential uh, influencers who are using social media, and whether that should be something that is a registrable interest. How you monitor it, how far you take that, I'm just raising part of the question, but it did seem to me that many of, the many of these particular points here would be minor by comparison with social media influences. That's, that's an interesting um, uh, observation. In fact, could we take uh, an action for uh, officers to consider and take advice perhaps from the LJ on how bloggers bloggers and bloggers social influences whether uh, they should be referred to in this section. Uh, I don't know if you've got, a, if you've got a, an immediate comment on that or whether it's a, a suggestion that uh, has merit. So, Councillor um, uh, Chairman, we'll be happily put something in writing and confirm the position on that. So I think the key okay. point is that many of these people have now paid considerable <laughs> sums of money yeah. to undertake. Well, they're undertaking their task, but their people are using it for advertising purposes and so forth. And it seems to me that is employment, and it does possibly come under one of whose principal purposes includes the influence of public opinion or policy. Uh, but I think we need to be explicit in our understanding of where that's taking us. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we're content with item, gender item eight. Yes. Uh, which just leaves us agenda item 11. The work, work program update. Um, work at program update, you have a room and the A4 sheets. Um, so, May's meeting. No changes. Um, I'm actually, a little bit of movement in terms of the arrows, but the change, so just in terms of the following discussions of previous meetings. Um, Thank you, Captain Matthews. Also, uh, in terms of um, external audits, our uh, people have indicated that the um, external audit plan, including indicative fee, report for June 2022 meetings, so that's not reflected on the sheet that you've got. There at the moment, um, and also an update to provide on progress to the 21 22 audit, um, and also that the autism annual report will be reported by December um, 2022. So, um, I suspect that's a can I Can I ask the committee's indulgence that we, um, we consider perhaps in June matters concerning um, ICT and um, uh, the uh, 
Well, it's pretty disgusting to see resilient um, cyber, cyber issues of cyber attack um, as a, I don't know if I had to, to, to suggest this as a report, but um, to, to have an opportunity to meet perhaps with the head of ICT um, to, uh, for him to cover or to give us, uh, for him to present us with, with what assurance is available as to the, uh, the organization's cyber resilience in light of um, cyber attack activity. Um, we did make um, an action in relation to the internal that right. report okay. that covers this. Um, and it might be that we just do it, have the June date for the next meeting. Um, it's, it's, then. Uh, yes, indeed, yes. It, it, was, it was the section one foot officer and the, and the chair was to determine the best way to approach on that. Um, so that, that action still records that. Um, uh, whether it comes back, it, it depends on the, the details that you want to impart because some of that may be. Um, uh, is it confidential perhaps, but, but it depends on the extent to which we want to explore that. Um, it might do. I think I think as a committee and as a council, we just we're probably just seeking an assurance, an up-to-date assurance that um, everything is in place and uh, uh, what assurance uh, ICT can give us specific. Can, can I suggest initially, um, can we ask for a briefing note to be circulated to committee members and then that will inform you how, how far well, you want to take it yeah. in terms of okay. the report? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Can I ask you? Yeah. I like to do these work plans and stuff. It's all, it's all really good and it works. But no one tells me on here how you prioritise what you're going to do when. And how what you've just suggested, how does that go up the priority of any other task that's on here? The, well, I don't, 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 so I don't, I don't know if you've changed, I mean, it's, it's not to, to bottom this and torpedo it for you because this is good work. It's just that when whenever you see these work plans and everybody puts a time on what they're going to do, they all look really good. But why is your proposal then more important, for example, than being important? Than any other work that's on here, and how, how does that get agreed to go into the work plan over a priority of any other action? So, sorry, are you talking about the action plan or the work program? I think both. Because, right. in terms of the work program, we have our meetings, they're the dates at the top. Yeah. So, the work program is essentially our terms of reference. Yeah. And it outlines in which meeting we are going to cover off each element of the terms of reference. Okay, that's so that's how this that's this brilliant. one's um, developed. And then in terms of the action plan, um, it's then built into the program. It's then built into the program where we where we feel that we have the capacity and um, and how urgently we really need to. So without giving without giving a personal influence of what you think should be in how as a committee do you decide where that fits in those plans? Through this work program session at the end of each meeting. Yeah. So, so as as I brought something forward, something that an emerging yeah. change or risk, um, I would ask the committee: Can we? Should we be considering this? Should we try and so if we wanted to do a deep dive, for instance, on a specific aspect, we we would look at the work program, where things naturally do change within the work program because. Yeah. External auditors, internal auditors have a different requirements placed upon them. Um, reports go back a month, they usually go back, but they usually come forward. Yeah. And, and occasionally we have opportunities then. We have not, not like today, where it's been a, a fairly full agenda. Um, we can ensure that there's we have the opportunity then to, to, uh, to look at uh, something which isn't per se in the work program, but is of uh, emerging interest to us. All right. And the, the reason I ask is I was quite keen to make sure that the prioritisation is known. Yeah. So if it's done by committee of voter funds, and OK, at least you have a procedure for saying what you're going to do. But also to come down to influence or preference for this. If something is quite important, always gets bumped off the agenda through time, whatever it is. So, and I'm quite keen to understand how you yeah. put that in. And, um, Although we have an action, um, so to understand, we have a, a, an action log um, during COVID. Um, that action log was uh, 
didn't get out of out of Gilton. Um, at the last meeting, we went through the action log with some in some detail, which we haven't done in this meeting, um, time um, and we went through each each action on the log individually, which is something which we would intend to do at least every other meeting. Yeah. Okay. I forgot what I was going to ask you, <laughs> but, but I will, I just go, go back to 106 anyway, but this was any do with what I was going to ask. I know it says yes, May, May, went to May, uh, I presume that was when the report came in on one of six monies. Um, how, do we know how far this is, this parish councils? I, I don't think I've received a copy of this. It may be on the website, but I don't think I've received it. Okay. A copy of it. Is it going to cabinet now or is it going to come? It was presented to cabinet on the 20th and then the date's wrong last right? It should be 2021, of course, yeah, not 2022. But, uh, 25th of November 21. It was presented to cabinet. Has cabinet approved it? Do we know? And it's going to come back to us because I'd like to share this to some of the parish councils because all the parish councils right now are. Are still struggling with 106 minus, but we're not giving them any answers. So if there is an answer here somewhere, yeah, um, my I don't know what if it has anything to do with us or not. Yeah. I, I don't. I think the action has been completed. Um, it, it's not an audit and governance business, but I understand that um, arrangements are being made more or less so as, as it stays. As it here. stays here, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but what the time scale is of engaging with parish councils? Yes, um, I, I you'd have we we you need to raise that I suppose with the with the uh, cabinet member. Or Andrew Lovegrove. Or Andrew Lovegrove. I think I'll go chase up Andrew again. I'll be chasing him for two years now. I'll keep chasing him. <laughs> yeah. It's um, just that there's money being taken by Belford Beatty that. Yeah. We, I don't know if it's, it's not mentioned here, and I'm just wondering. Yeah. I don't know, uh, Joe's on this um, call. Are you, <laughs> are you <laughs> to drag you in um, unexpectedly? Um, are you aware of Dale's for the implementation of this, this one of six? Um, yeah, I'm really sorry. I'm really struggling to hear the sound quality is not great. So um, could you just pose the question again to me, please? Um, Right, within our Audit and Governance Committee Action Log, Action 103, um, a uh, information on the treatment of Section 106 monies for Transport Highways that circulated to committee members. And the, the action has been completed, uh, and it states that the report was presented to Cabinet on Thursday, the 25th of November 2021, entitled Section 106 Portfolio of Works and Deliver Delivery Proposals. Um, and it's, it's quite a long section, but over the next 12 months, their tasks will include reviewing and allocating section 106 monies in line with current strategies policies, and taking initial consultation liaison with local members, parish councils, schools, etc., contract managing, raising, etc., etc. It goes on to numbers. I just wondered whether we knew from a finance point of view when. Um, when those funds and actions are likely to be implemented. Yeah, or come close to it, even information would be nice. Yeah, can I, can I actually come back to you, um, as Ben suggested, can I actually come back to you with a, with a short briefing note on that? Um, I think I have the answer to that, but I'd like to be clear before I do respond. Oh, no, no, that's, that, that's understandable. Uh, the final sentence says, members will have their own projects in their wards and parishes, which will be taken up individually with them by the program management office. So I suspect it's the program management office that needs to provide members mm -hmm. with the, uh, the activity, uh, the activity lists. It's a game. So uh, I think, can I, can I put in that? Are you happy to take, oh, you happy to take, I'd like to put an action on offices to speak with the program management office and come back to us with, with when um, the program management office anticipates they will have spoken to ward members. All right, that, that, that ties it down a bit. Okay, is that, are you happy with that, Joe? I don't want to give you an action you got. No, absolutely, that's absolutely fine. 
Thank you, Chair. I can't accept that. Um, just if we're all happy with the work program update, one final uh, question. Uh, agenda item 12 with dates of future meetings. Um, dates of consideration here. I know the clerks uh, worked extremely diligently to try and identify um, space not only for these meetings but also for the briefing meetings that we try and hold two weeks before the meeting itself. Um, what I would say is if you can please consult your diaries um, and see whether these dates are and times are suitable. Um, there is some wriggle room, I think, at the moment for alternative dates, um, but the wriggle room is decreasing rapidly, um, especially because we have a we expect to have a future uh, additional screening committee that has to be accommodated with the office of time and facility time as well. So if we can get back to uh, Bain with any um, problems, that would be much appreciated. I think that's for you only. It, it raises, <laughs> this raises quite an important point that um, it's going to be quite common that people are going to have to find alternates. I mean, I looked at the dates and already got no, no, no on some of them. Uh, and that's becoming increasingly difficult when you've got more committees. There is an issue here as to how we do populate and how we do manage it, because the amount of time spent on council work is increasing exponentially. 242 pages today is a good example. Um, you know, I don't know what your Sunday was like, but I know what I was spent most of you doing. And it, it does sort of raise quite a, an interesting issue with regard to us trying to have people who are not retired being actually actively working, being councillors, and then getting, this is a mandatory meeting you have to attend as part of your training. I think we've we as a governance group, but it's somehow it's part of our function, we've got to seriously look at how this is going to get managed. So it's going to become really quite it's difficult enough now for anybody employed. I think it's going to get even worse. Yeah, my issue is that mandatory work is coming so late. You know, this is one year left before the next election, and we have more mandatory work now than we've ever had. I don't mind the mandatory work if it's done early enough that I'm going to be able to use it generally. Anyway, that's it. Yeah, it's something which point, points taken on board. Um, um, can I thank especially um, yourself, Councillor Summers and Councillor Andrews for that? Uh, so, you know, I enjoy it. It's been fun. And Councillor Ginny for your contributions, and Councillor Balderson for stepping in to, to chair the initial part of the meeting, which I think I don't know why it's so hard to get committee members. I enjoy it. Sorry. <laughs> and hopefully, Councillor Bartlett, um, you, you uh, stay with us throughout and, um, and you're feeling a bit better now. Uh, hopefully, uh, going forward. Just close the stream. Um, can we close the stream? And um, thank everybody for, for contributing. <laughs>